Hey everyone, welcome to a very special edition of Web Sleuth YouTube Live. My name is Tricia Griffith, the very proud owner of WebSleuths.com, and tonight it is our yearly special on the John Benet Ramsey case. Uh, in a little while, Cynic is going to join us. Cynic is a, an absolute genius, and his knowledge of the John Benet Ramsey case is unbelievable. He'll be joining us, and we're going to go over the evidence, a lot of the evidence, but the one thing that we're really going to make sure that gets across to everybody is Patsy wrote the note. When you grasp that, when you see that, you will understand there was no intruder. Uh, I have a very special guest with us tonight. Uh, it's somebody I've admired a great deal over what, how many years, over 20 years uh, since this case has, uh, God, more than that, 25 since the John Bonet Ramsey case, um, this gentleman gave up so much of his life to get the truth out about John Bonet. And everybody, I'd like you to welcome former Boulder police detective Steve Thomas. Steve, how are you tonight? Hello, Tricia. I'm uh, I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for the call and the invitation. And good to talk to you. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn you up just a little bit. Make sure everybody can hear you. And uh, when you go back and look at the chat, you're gonna see, you're gonna see all the love coming at you. Uh, so you know, just <laughs> okay. just get ready, just get ready for that. Um, <clears throat> Steve, so much has happened since, obviously, since that night in 1996. And I don't think anybody in their right mind thought we would be here discussing this case at this date. Uh, I remember the John Biddy Ramsey case was the the reason I got on the internet uh, was to look it up because I couldn't believe there was something like called a six-year-old beauty queen. I thought it was a typo in the newspaper. And so much has happened since then. But let's let's just get right to the brass tacks, as they say. Can you give us your general thoughts about the case as, as it stands today or the case in general? Uh, well, I'll, I'll speak at a, at a high level in, in very general terms, but... Uh, um, uh, at, at the top of my mind, 26 years later, uh, I, I feel it's just so important uh, for the truth to prevail in this case uh, at, at some point. Uh, I've witnessed through the years uh, all the many, uh, I'll, I'll call it news cycles, where there's been a lot of addition and subtraction of the of the facts uh and it's it's not surprising to me uh knowing what i know about the case uh that uh current day the public just doesn't know uh what to believe um uh, th there's so much out there that's that's not accurate uh, uh so my continued hope remains that one day there's going to be some uh definitive closure to this case by the agencies in Boulder, the very professional district attorney's office now, and the Boulder Police Department, uh, that uh, um, they'll be able to uh, definitively close this case once and for all. And I hope you're right, because uh, every time we think it might happen, then, you know, it, it doesn't. And I have a billion zillion questions, but I, I know you are very limited on your time. So we're going to get to a few more here. Uh, recently, there was an article in the Washington Times, and everybody, I put that link in chat. Um, let me put it again so you can read it. We'll read it again later with Dan, but it was a very definitive uh, article by Jeff Shapiro, and it really called out the lies, in my opinion, the lies that have been out there, going out there lately. Sorry, my my fault. Uh Jeff Shapiro did a great job of pointing out the facts of the case. What did you think of the uh, Washington Times uh, article? Yeah, Tricia, what a what a great piece. What an excellent commentary piece by uh, Shapiro in the Washington Times last week. Uh, it, it's just as uh, uh, it, that pendulum swings, we're sort of in this era. Uh, that you know the, the the police just get 
bashed endlessly. Um, but the, uh, um, not the headline, but the uh, subline to the headline, I, I, I thought that was perfect. It said, uh, uh, contrary to recent media reports, the Boulder police were always committed to justice. And that was uh, indeed the reality that I witnessed, the reality that I experienced. Um, uh, great, great piece. Um, uh, 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 he hit a lot of the uh, very key points in the case. Um, uh, and related, uh, um, Mitch Morrissey, one of the three special grand jury prosecutors uh, who were brought in to uh, run the grand jury in 98 and 99. I heard him on a podcast just very recently uh, commenting uh, that there are very good people in Boulder and at the Boulder Police Department uh, working on the case uh, present day. Um, and, and, and further, uh, my experience was... Uh, um, not just the time I was involved, uh, but in the ensuing couple of decades, there have been remarkably good investigators and prosecutors uh, that have put eyes on this case uh, um, and experts from uh, a variety of disciplines, uh, FBI agents, CBI, GBI, uh, even uh, the Royal Canadi Canadian Mounted Police uh, uh, made an appearance. So. Uh, the Boulder police have uh, sought and welcomed uh, experts and other law enforcement agencies throughout the course of uh, this this case, despite you know some uh, argument uh, to the to the contrary. Uh, but but the Washington Times uh, piece I thought was excellent and and really synopsized all that. Um, just to update uh, the people that are just joining us, we have former. Boulder Police Detective Steve Thomas on with us. We're talking about a piece written by Jeff Shapiro, Shapiro in the Washington Times. And lately, John Ramsey's John Ramsey has been on a this this media blitz talking about how the police didn't ask for any help and you know they were just traffic cops, and that's all a lie. And and this is me talking, nobody else. And uh, Jeff Shapiro points that out beautifully in the article. And Steve, as you said, uh, the Boulder police received a lot of help. The, you, you all went to the experts and for John Ramsey to keep doing this is, is unbelievable. So please everybody read that article. I'll put it in the description. I've already put it in chat. Um, but Steve, again, I know your time is extremely limited, but I have to ask you, how are you doing? What are you doing? What's up going on with your life? Uh, well, good. I'm doing good. Tracia, I'm, uh, I've been in the private sector for a long time now. Um, uh, I, I still, at times, miss police work. Uh, that was a career calling for me. Uh, um, sometimes you find something in life that uh, uh, you latch on to early uh, um, as a kid. And I, um, I, I sought, sought that career field out. And uh, um Really, really enjoyed my time in uh, police work, trying to trying to do good work, and uh, I think I was pretty good at it. Some people have, have said I <laughs> said I was, uh, but uh, uh, um, I still enjoy many great, great relationships with with great people uh, in law enforcement that I worked with. Uh, just had dinner with a. Uh, just a remarkable GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation agent, uh, a few weeks ago in Florida, um, who who was tremendously helpful to us on this case. Just a, a, a great guy, a great agent. Um, still stay in touch with former colleagues in Boulder and Denver and uh, Jefferson County, Colorado, those law enforcement agencies. Um, but otherwise, uh, Trisha, I, I lead a, a fairly anonymous life. Um, uh, I have work colleagues and, and counterparties uh, that uh, have no idea um, uh, what I what I did in a prior career, right. uh, a, a prior life. But um, uh, and as you know, I've always uh, been a, a very private person. Um, but I, 
no, every, everything's good. Very, very grateful for uh, uh, where I am uh, in life and uh, um, uh, w- want to wish everybody, your audience, a, a, a very happy new year um, uh, uh, in 2023. And again, uh, just to round it out, uh, I, I hope at some point um, uh, the, the truth prevails and uh, the, this case can be definitively uh, cleared and closed. Well, Steve, uh, on behalf of everybody in chat, and they're calling you the GOAT. That's a good thing. Just so you know, when they call you the GOAT, that means you're the original. I, I thought it was an insult when they called me the GOAT. I'm like, oh, that's rude. But no, everybody is is giving you the love. And on behalf of so many thousands of people over the years that I've gotten to know through Web Sleuths and ForumsForJustice.org, the thousands of posters that have posted on this case, I want to thank you for everything that you have done for a little girl you didn't know, John Benet Ramsey. Steve, thank you. You know you're always welcome here at 24/7. You say you want to come on the air, we're on, and uh, we'll we'll talk about anything you want. And if you need anything, I always tell people this, and it's the absolute truth. Web Sleuths is an army, and we can help. So anything you need, you just let us know, okay? Uh, thank thank you, Trish, and a, a similar sentiment back uh, um, for. Um, uh, all the, all that you do and being on the right side of uh, so many of these things and uh, uh, thank you and uh, 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 thank you to Cynic. I enjoy listening to him. Uh, out of out of anybody that was not uh, um, directly involved in this case uh, as an investigator, a prosecutor, an expert, etc. Uh, just as a civilian, his uh, capacity and grasp of the facts and details is in, it, it, it's sort of an encyclopedic knowledge that he has that I know he can't do that off of notes. He just has a remarkable memory of, of the details uh, of this case. And uh, I, I don't know uh, what, what he does for a living, uh, pre, uh, you know, if he's in, in law enforcement or investigator of some sort, but uh, really, really well well versed in in uh in all the facts and nuances of this case so uh um uh please give him my best I and will. uh I'll, I'll see you on the show again uh, uh on your show again trisha uh, sooner or later okay. thank you and just to let you know um dan said uh, as cynic said i could tell you what he does and uh, he's a stripper so um <laughs> Just so you know, just my guy is one of those smart guys, you know. So okay. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all Steve. right, Trish. All the best. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. I, you know, what a great guy. What a great guy. Um, uh, yeah. And Cynic. Cynic is coming up here. So let's bring Cynic up. And I got to remove this uh, thing. That was quite the con- But he's absolutely right, Cynic. He's absolutely right. You are a, just an encyclopedia of knowledge, and it's the knowledge that you know everybody needs. And uh, and every you know, I, I just can't say enough good about you, my dear. How are you? Whoops, I guess I should demute you. That might help. There you go. Can hey, you hear Trish, me? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I was just Great. kidding about the stripper. <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> Wow, all, all of a sudden I feel tremendous pressure after those <laughs> accolades from Steve. Wow. Um. Well, it's true. It's absolute truth, my dear. Um, that I, I mean, even right before this show, I'm, you know, freaking out because I can't find what I was looking for. And you have it right there. I don't know, and I gotta tell this story real quick. There years and years ago, Aphrodite Jones did a and she has since changed her mind about it and and fixed it. But she did a terrible uh, show like a one hour show on like discovery ID or one of those about the John Benet Ramsey case. And they told Aphrodite that she was talking to the investigators. Well, she thought they were the police investigators. No, they were the, the dummies, you know, on the Ramsey side hired by Tracy, Michael Tracy to do the work. And they just lied to her. They flat out lied to her. So I, I didn't know this when, then when this was aired, so I called Dan. I said, Dan, we've got to do a rebuttal to this. I said, I'll get on it. I'll I'll start and and you put together what you can and, and maybe we can merge them. And I'm like getting my paper ready and getting, you know, some notes. He's got it all done. The whole hour thing. I'm telling you, within 15 minutes, he had 
taken everything she had said and boom, but boom, but boom. And since then, I've actually gotten to know her and and consider her just a, a wonderful person. And she she felt terrible and she has fixed it since then. So um, if you can hang on just one minute, I need to let my obnoxious dog out, Cynic, and I will be right back. OK, sounds good. Well, what a what a great thing it was to hear Steve Thomas. Um, anyone who's uh, followed the the Ramsey case is uh, obviously blown away by uh, by Steve's uh, book and uh, the effort that he put into the case. Uh, it's just uh, you know, wor words uh, wor words fail me when it comes to uh, uh, the respect that I have for Steve and and the work that he did on the case and. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I re recently reread uh, his book, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, just to hear what it did to him physically, his health. Um, oh, it went uh, down the it went down the drain. He gave up everything, cynic. You know, I mean, as he says in the book, his health went to hell. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he quit his job. He wrote the book. I, I mean, my God, it, and it's just followed him everywhere. And I found it very interesting that he said none of his current colleagues they know nothing about his prior life which i find very interesting because i bet they would just be stunned and, and i'm glad because i'm sure he'd be hounded like crazy with uh with questions about the case so yes yeah okay. yeah okay i have to do one more thing and shut the window because my obnoxious dog is barking <laughs> there we go Okay. Okay. Okay, Dave. I mean, Cynic. I mean, Sam. I mean, George. <laughs> I mean, Cynic. Um, I don't even know where to start, to be honest. I'll tell you what, let's start. Let's just talk about John Ramsey and what he's been doing lately. And then um, I'm going to bring up Insightful One. Uh, she is my co host and executive producer. And insightful, I need you to monitor the comments and then I'll come to you every so often for the questions, okay? Okay. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, John Ramsey has been on this crusade and every time he opens his mouth, it's like it, it, the lies get worse and worse. And uh, the one he told lately, I, I don't know if it was to Megan Kelly or to Ashley Banfield, but it was, uh, these were traffic cops basically. They came to the scene, you know, and they didn't ask for any help. And that's a lie. That's an absolute lie. So um, I I think that the big question, and I, I, I would like your opinion on this, is why is he doing this? They got away with it. You know, whatever it was, whatever it happened to be, they got away with it. Why doesn't he just shut his mouth? What do, what do you think? He might be getting ready to, uh, to pass the baton over to uh, John Andrew, um, mm -hmm. just sort of getting getting the case out there again, uh, and uh, as I say, perhaps uh, uh, say passing the baton, the torch, what have you, to to John Andrew, and uh, having him go forward when uh, he can no longer, uh, you know, do interviews or he passes away or. Mm -hmm. or, or something that, as I say, prevents him from uh, from doing these things himself. But uh, and, and maybe there's some money involved. I, I don't know who, who pays him. Uh, I, I know some uh, some outlets do not. But as as we've discussed in the past, uh, they could still pay him for uh, the use of uh, materials, uh, videos, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pictures, personal pictures that he may have. That type of thing. So, you know, I'm sure there's there's avenues uh, open to to funnel money toward toward John if if that's one of his motivations. Um, you know, as I say, I, I don't really, you know, I, I know he lives in in Utah, I think in Moab, uh, Utah, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think he lives a terribly uh, lavish lifestyle, but he lives a very comfortable lifestyle, which I'm sure still requires some some financial some financial input here and there. So perhaps that's it. And, uh, 
Uh, and, and as I say, maybe it's uh, passing things on to John Andrew. Certainly, it's not going to be Burke. I'll tell you that much. No, no. <laughs> after his, after his uh, Dr. Phil episode, I don't think you're ever going to see Burke in public again. It, it, exactly. Um, uh, real quickly, uh, John Andrew is a, a snotty little rich kid, in my opinion. I tried to have a conversation with him on Twitter, and he blocked me, called me troll, you know. And um, I, I just, I don't know. It, it, it again. What's what's interesting is like at CrimeCon, and we're going to get to all the evidence here, I promise. But at CrimeCon, the two uh, appearances by John Ramsey, the auditorium was it was sold out. It was packed and ninety nine point nine nine percent of them were all pro Ramsey. But yet when they do national surveys, vast majority of people say there was no intruder. The Ramseys are guilty. And remember the grand jury came back with an indictment of John and Patsy Ramsey in the death of John Bonet. Uh, Alex Hunter just decided not to file charges and he did not tell the truth and say an indictment had been returned. So that's again, a whole other story. Um, before we get to the um, nitty gritty here, Insightful One, any questions that we can, uh, we can jump into? Not yet. Okay, very good. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's start with the the window. And Jean Panic, you had a, a question about that, but I, I want to show a picture. Okay, now this is the basement window that the Ramseys claim the intruder came through. Now, I want you to know there are pictures of dust on this window seal. Okay, it's a basement window. There are pictures of dust. There are pictures of leaves, and it's not disturbed at all. There was a spider web that wasn't disturbed. I'm going to show you a picture now of Lou Smith, who has since passed, but he was the big Ramsey, pro Ramsey guy. And um, he tries to go through the window to show you exactly uh, how the intruder got in. And when you see his, uh, uh, his rear end scrape against the window seal. You just know it's absolutely ridiculous. So let me get to that right now. No, I don't want that. I want to add a, there we go. Not a video clip. I want to add a damn picture. Oh my God, these people. Where's the picture? I'm sorry, guys. I had it all set up. Now it's disappeared on me. Overlay. That's what I want. Where is the overlay pictures, people? Hang on one second. I thought I had it right handy. Overlay, there's Lacey. There we go. Okay. Now. Mm -hmm. um, here we go. Smith window. And the thing to keep in mind there, too, is that Smith was a pretty thin guy as well. And he, even mm -hmm. his body occupies, you know, more or less the entire area. Right. Oops, this is the wrong one. I just need to delete some of these to make some room. So sorry about that. Okay. And Smith also did this in pretty light clothing as well. If it was uh, a few things, if it was a heavier individual, um, that would be a problem. And also, mm -hmm. it was winter time, and it was a pretty cold, uh, pretty cold day and night uh, in right. Boulder that particular day as well. So, if you're wearing some. Uh, some nice warm clothing there that's going to make uh, you scrape even more things uh, into, into the basement area if you could even get through. Exactly. Now, there you go. Look at that, people. And think about the fact that there was no dust disturbed. There were no leaves disturbed. There was a spider web around the area. Do you really think an intruder came through that window? I mean, it's just common sense, for God's sakes. It's absolute common sense sense. Now, there's been, I, I was looking at um, some of the uh, older videos, and one of them, they talked about Fleet White putting the suitcase up against the window. Well, that's John Bonet Ramsey's friend who went to search for John Bonet. Did we, was that ever determined that Fleet White did actually put that suitcase above the window and put a piece of glass on top of it or not? Yes, uh, it's it's in it's in the police interviews uh, with uh, with him. I'm not sure if it was in 
the deposition, I'd have to go back and take a look at that when That's he was deposed when he was when he was deposed for the Chris Wolf uh, case, but. Um, he, he definitely that's it's it's on the record that uh, he did move the, the he did move the suitcases he was kind of looking around for uh, for for glass from uh, from the window that he saw was uh, was broken okay and John Ramsey admitted he broke that window because he left his keys he locked himself out that was like I think over the summer and he admitted he broke the window so let's look at this and let's get rid of the suitcase once and for all everybody the intruder did not come through this window. All right. I, I've got a, I've got some info uh, a while back. I put together some, some of the sort of the changing stories. I, I know the last time we, I was on your show, I encourage people to uh, take a good look through the, uh, through the interviews that law enforcement had with, uh, with the Ramses uh, because it, you, it doesn't take too terribly long before you start to see the inconsistencies. And uh, if you wish to call them lies, uh, you, mm -hmm. you can certainly do that. Um, but there's, uh, at the very least, uh, what could be classed as uh, some very significant inconsistencies in, uh, uh, in the stories between not only uh, what's, uh, what's laid out during those interviews, but also uh, as part of their sort of book tour, uh, the Ramses uh, also uh, made uh, had, had a number of interviews in which they spoke about uh, certain elements of the case, and uh, there's some there's some uh, inconsistencies between what was said during that book tour uh, and other interviews, and also the law enforcement interviews. So, with respect to the to the broken uh, basement window, uh, what John says he remembers, he says he broke a part of the window leading to the train room, which is the room in question here. I said I did it at night. I had a suit on, took my suit off, and did it in my underwear. That was a 1997, uh, 1997 interview. Uh, then he further said I still had my shoes on, and then he says it was like about 11:30 at night. Uh, then at other times he doesn't seem to remember. He's, he doesn't remember the month or the day he broke it. He says I think it was last summer. Uh, he doesn't really. Not totally clear on the year he broke it. He said in a 1990 uh, interview, he claims that he went to look at the window on the morning of December 26 because, quote, I was just trying to verify in my own mind that I had in fact broken the window last summer. Uh, was it broken once or several times? He says, I think it was broken by me once before. And then later, actually in that same interview, uh, he says, Well, I can't remember exactly when it was. I've done it maybe twice, maybe three times during the period of time we owned the house. It was a way that I could get in the house if we didn't have a key that was the least expensive to repair. Uh, it was one single uh, pane of non-insulated glass, and I think that was done one summer. I came back late in the evening. Uh, as to why he didn't have a key, a uh, number of explanations. Uh, for some reason, I didn't have a key. I don't know why. <laughs> then he says, um, it's uh, usually if I don't drive my car, I take a cab or something to the airport and back and I don't have a key and the house keys are on the key ring. Another alternative explanation, I think I'd given my key to John Andrew or somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not really clear on whether he drove, a whole, uh, drove home or took a cab, I don't recall specifically, he said in 1998. He doesn't remember whether his neighbors had a key, although the Barn Hills did have a key. I doesn't remember whether he removed his shirt to climb through the window. He says, quote, I might have taken my shirt off, 1998. Um, how he broke the window, he says, quote, might have been my foot. I don't know. I think you'd remember how you broke a window. I would think, yeah. Um, then he says he's not sure whether he replaced the grate that had to be removed to, to gain access to the window well. He said, quote, I would have probably done it that night. Um, how the, then he also says, um, it's funny how you remember things. I swear that the window opened from the other side. So it's not even clear how the window opened in one particular interview. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, it's, you know, what, well, yeah, what can you say? It's, uh, you know, so many things come to mind. Uh, just on this it, one, just on this one thing. Yeah. He, uh, and why wouldn't you, you know, you have children in your home, not only your own, but other, uh, other children that come over to play. Uh, why wouldn't you uh, fix a, a broken window that has all sorts of sharp shards all over the place that Good could question. potentially hurt or, you know hurt somebody. Uh, he's concerned, and Patsy, <laughs> Patsy says that you know, oh, you know, I 
I made sure that you know, vacuumed up all the glass and, and everything else there, which is, uh, and this also, uh, I should note that this was uh, disputed by uh, the housekeeper, uh, Linda Hoffman Pugh. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in one of the interviews with law enforcement, Patsy said that uh, Linda helped her clean up the glass downstairs. Um, uh, and Linda says, no, that never happened. I never cleaned up any glass at all. I'm not aware of anything to do with that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it just kind of goes on and on. One simple little thing. But uh, in terms of what happened there, you know, who knows? I, maybe it was uh, some sort of late night staging attempt, uh, putting, you know, putting a suitcase in there because the suitcase uh, had a Dr. Seuss book and whatever else there. Is that the suitcase that had the blanket with uh, John Andrews' semen on it as well? Yeah. Yeah. And again, that had nothing to, nothing to do with this case. So here, when you hear about how the intruder got through the window and Lou Smith proved it, he didn't. It's a lie. It didn't happen. And we've just shown you, when I say we, I mean, of course, Cynic, because he's the best in the world, just explain to you how... Uh, you know, the suitcase wasn't put there for the uh, the intruder to climb up it and get out. No. Uh, Fleet White said he put the suitcase there. Okay? He said he did it. And then put a piece of glass on top of it. So, I think we can put the suitcase to bed now, don't you think? I think so. If you want, you can roll that little video of the, uh, of the basement uh, walkthrough by... Uh, by law enforcement. As oh, is that is that, is that on uh, Vimeo? Yes, Vimeo. Okay, let me let me grab it really quickly here. I'm not sure if I can download it or not, but let me check. Um, hold on here. Let me, it'll take just a second. While we're doing this, insightful one. Uh, any questions? How about if you read a few comments? I do have a question. Lauren asks: Has Fleet White ever broken his silence? Well, Fleet, Fleet White is, depends on what you mean uh, by um, broken silence uh, in terms of, say, going on, um, you know, say, like mainstream media and being interviewed and chatting about the case. Uh, no, he, he's a pretty private guy. He has uh, questioned. He's filed uh, a number of legal motions to try to get certain uh, bits of, uh, of, the, of the case uh, into the public forum. Uh, he really was very intent after the, uh, uh, after the information regarding the grand jury uh, decision to, uh, to indict the Ramses uh, came out. He wanted, uh, because there was a number of redactions uh, to, the, to what came out, and he uh, he was very intense uh, and, and filed some 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 legal uh, paperwork to try to get that unredacted uh, and as much of what happened in the grand jury uh, out as possible. He's um, he's test he's he's been in front of uh, Boulder City Council. Uh, actually, both he and his children. There's some. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that video is still uh, available. It was on forumsforjustice.org uh, uh, at mm -hmm. one point. So you know, he's he's been out and about. Uh, a lot, much of it has been behind the scenes in terms of uh, sort of legal uh, legal paperwork to try to get one thing or another uh, sorted out. Uh, and he was deposed as part of the uh, Chris Wolf uh, civil case. And um, not all of it was released, but there's uh, a little bit there as well, which is available uh, in, in the public domain. So I, I guess kind of yes and no. He certainly hasn't been a, a you know like John Ramsey and, and 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 others out there giving you know giving interviews here and there for whatever purpose. He's never he has not written a book. Uh, he doesn't intend to, as far as I know. Um, so he, he basically is a pretty private guy. I suppose I would certainly compare him uh, much more closely to Steve Thomas uh, than, you know, than perhaps anybody else uh, in the case in terms of sort of privacy and, and wishing to remain private. I know he, he was approached by the CBS uh, team that did the, uh, 
uh, the, the 20th anniversary uh, special um, and he, he turned them down. They did show up at his house and, and so on, number of phone calls. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken to, to Fleet on a few occasions and I know Tricia certainly has. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, he's willing to talk about a few things about the case, but, uh, it, you know, even uh, with somebody such as Tricia, who, I th you know, he does uh, know to, to a fair degree, uh, me to a far lesser degree, but, uh, you know, he'll talk about a few things to the case, but uh, other, th other things he's certainly pretty, uh, pretty quiet on. He he'll discuss some of the things that, uh, you know, as I say, he's done uh, legally, but that's about as far in terms of you try to ask him, well, can you kind of give me a, you know, minute by minute account of what happened, uh, you know, when you were there that day? No, that's just not going to happen. He's not that's the kind of guy, the guy he is. Yeah. Um, I do have that video here and um, let's go ahead and play it. Here we go. I think this is the one. It's, it's one that starts. Yeah. With the picture. Of the My name is Jonathan Webb. I was a grand jury. Was that oh, okay? Is it because nope. it has a picture? Well, it has a picture of a suitcase and the window on it. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, you can play this. This is good, but this is not the one. Okay, well, hold on. This, this oh, is what? quite good, though. Okay, well, let's play this one. Let's play it. <laughs> it's because, you know, again, you can kind of see who the smart one is here, <laughs> who the one that should go back to maybe kindergarten. That would be me. Here we go. Sure, on the job of Ramsey case. Webb told us that the grand jury spent most of their time focused on two main issues. First, who wrote that ransom note? We heard from three handwriting experts. And even though the handwriting experts couldn't definitively say that she wrote it, they all three came to the same conclusion that it could have been Patsy Ramsey. And the grand jury believed that she wrote it. The second focus for this grand jury, according to Jonathan Webb, was the viability of the intruder theory. Smith actually presented his intruder theory to the grand jury. This is the very first photo taken of the train room basement window. The window is wide open. Now, if I was a detective, I would have said, wow, this is that but the grand jury wasn't buying the intruder theory because of those cobwebs in the window. The intruder theory didn't make sense to the to the grand jury. The, the Boulder police had photographed cobwebs. So for someone to get through a small opening like that and not disturbing a cobweb would be remarkable. Patsy and John are accused of permitting a child to be unreasonably placed in a situation which posed a threat of injury to the child's life or health, which resulted in the death of John Benet Ramsey. And then in the other one, did unlawfully, knowingly, and feloniously render assistance to a person with intent to hinder the apprehension of the person. These two things together make it clear that the grand jury couldn't point the finger at one or the other, but that they were convinced that it was one of the two of them and that the other one helped. Okay, that's really good, you know. That is excellent. The the one that um, uh, has the actually the, the basement walkthrough video, uh, although there's some clips of that in that video. Um, it was uh, it actually has Mary Lacey at the beginning. It's called the, Mary, the oh, Lacey okay. press conference. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. I, that's, so, I didn't yeah. think that was it. Let me grab it. Let me grab it yeah. real quick. Okay. So I've yeah, got you'll my... you'll you'll find this uh, <laughs> you'll find this interesting because. It has our good friend Mary Lacey on it. So. Oh, our wonderful good friend. She's such a, we just love her. Come on. There we go. Okay, this is it right here. Okay, let me share this. Hang on. And just by way of uh, prefacing this, it's... Um, it's where Mary Lacey uh, is being questioned by a reporter. And as during the course of the qu questioning, she tries to explain why in the world uh, they spent tens of thousands of dollars bringing John Mark Carr over to the United States from Thailand. And, and just a really interesting side note, um, the so-called evidence that she had against John Mark Carr was incorrect. It was wrong. 
it was at these emails from Michael Tracy and John Mark Carr, and he got everything wrong, and she still arrested him. Okay, mm -hmm. anyway, here we go, everybody. Um, you've released all the emails, at least all the emails that we have seen. And everyone in this room has read those emails, and clearly you are very familiar with those emails. Everything in those emails is publicly available and has been on the internet for years. So you or I or anybody in this room could have concocted a story and fantasized exactly like he did. When you brought him to Boulder, Colorado, and this was several days, five days you had, you knew who he was, then he was arrested in Thailand. Then you had time, he was brought to California and then here. In that period of time, when you brought him and he stepped off the plane in Boulder, Colorado, what other evidence did you have? Phone records, credit card records, witnesses, anything that could place him in Boulder, in the state of Colorado, any time around Christmas of 1996. What did you have that said other than his bizarre statements in these emails, which any of us could have concocted, what else did you have that placed him here? Well, let's start with the fact that as far as we can tell, there is no physical evidence in this case that it has not been in the public domain. The ability of our office or any law enforcement to connect this crime to a person based on something they know about it that no one else knows was what? gone a long time ago. That's impossible. Yeah. So yours is a good question and that, you know, we, we check every time something comes up. It has this been in the public domain. I mean, for instance, there were a couple of references which um, we weren't sure were in the public domain. One was the fact that John Bonet had received the bracelet on her arm uh, from her mother as a Christmas present, but that's in the public domain. It's in the autopsy report. Um, the other one was the uh, presence of the mucus from the nose under the tape, not over it, but under it. Um, you could, I mean, a child's going to have a runny nose. That it's not going to take the a question leap of faith to come have? up with that. What else did you have? Well, I'm laying that the groundwork for that because that's the bottom that's line consistent. is what you're saying is is that you had his statements, but Tom Bennett's saying we reached out. We have you had nothing else. There's nothing that placed him in Boulder. Nothing that placed him in Colorado except his bizarre statements that he was here and he committed the crime. That's I all you have. I love this guy. Nothing else. Okay, so yeah, now it's going to go into the basement video, and it's a fairly uh, brief little walkthrough. And you'll see at the end of it uh, some some good close-ups of the uh, of the window area with the uh, with cobwebs and and the fact that uh, it, it's obviously uh, dirty. Uh, nobody has gone through there. And there's a perfectly good chair there, too. As a matter of fact, there's about three chairs in the area. There's no need to to, to be stepping on any yeah. kind of a suitcase. And you guys, this is a big thing that they bring up all the time. Uh, the Ramsey intruder people is, oh, he got in through the window. Uh, we're going to get to two major things tonight, and that's the DNA and the ransom note. And if by that time you're not convinced that there was no intruder. I'm not trying to say what happened because we don't know, but we, I can say there was no intruder. And if you can't say it by the end of the show, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. 
there's the broken glass. Uh, let me read this by Iron Butterfly. And thank you so much for the super chat. So that I would think that John Bonet had a substan substantial insurance policy given her career under her parents, of course, and the fact that Patsy was terminally ill, could this have been a motive between Patsy and John? Uh, at the time of John Bonet's death, she was not terminally ill. Uh, I do not think for one second that there was an insurance or the insurance policy was the motive, but that is an excellent question because a lot of times you just got to follow the money. Uh, in this case, I don't think that's it. But thank you, Iron Butterfly. Thank you very much. Just in case you still think that an intruder could have gotten through that window, look at that. Nothing is disturbed, my friends. Nothing. And I apologize if it seems like I'm pounding this in your head, but just got to get people to see that that's the big theory was he came in through the window and it's what they've always said. And it can't be, it just can't be. And Dan, thank you again for getting this to me. I, I can't thank you enough. No problem. Oh, what did it end? Hold on. Where'd it go? Oh, it did end. Okay. Hang tight, everybody. Okay. So we've got the suitcase done. And now we touched a little bit on the grand jury. Again, the grand jury voted to indict the Ramses. And and Lou Smith was able to present every piece of evidence to show the intruder. That is so rare in a grand jury investigation. But he was able to, and they still indicted the Ramses. They both were indicted on a murder charge for their daughter, John Benet Ramsey. So, and what I love about that press conference with Mary Lacey, I, I don't know what the hell she was trying to say. Do you, Senate, do you have any idea what the, what she was trying to make? I, she was making no sense to me. Well, she, uh, it, was a, it was a fairly lengthy press conference. I'm trying to think it was probably, I think it was close to an hour and it had, uh, uh, it had Bennett's her primary um, primary DA's office, uh, DA office investigator. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, hold on. I'm, gonna, I'm going to, um, be invisible for just a minute, but I can hear you. So continue, please. Yes, it, it had, uh, I think there was three, three or four people, I'm trying to recall, but anyway, had Bennett's, had Lacey, one other person, oh, um, McGuire, um, another DA, um, co-counsel, investigator, what have you. Uh, and they were all involved in, in answering a number of questions. I, I think I recognize uh, uh, some, a couple a couple of the reporters by, by voice. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, there, there was some good questioning there. That was and, great. Um, and one of the funny things uh, during that conference was that Mary uh, Lacey was uh, complaining that uh, she'd received uh, phone messages, I believe. I think they were phone messages, not emails. Uh, saying that she be she should be tarred and feathered and run out of town. That was like that was one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, um. Okay, we're not that uh, you know we're not that dramatic, but boy, it's frustrating. <laughs> it's frustrating when you see a DA just and like this. I love this reporter. Do you know his name? No, that's it's. Uh, I, I I think I, I recognize like Carol McKinley by voice, and right. um, I, I don't know. If, Maybe uh, it could have been somebody like like uh, Brennan. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, but yeah, he, he was good. Whoever he was, I wish I did know, but uh, unfortunately, yeah. I don't. And, and uh, he's saying you had no evidence, and so why did you bring him in? Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, his point is so it, is so valid because mm -hmm. all you have to do to be a John Mark Carr is to and and actually John Mark Carr was not very good uh, in terms of his grasp of the case. No. A lot of times, if you, I, I didn't have the, a, a lot of times I've got the stomach to, to kind of go through nonsense, mm -hmm. but in terms of the, the emails and the absolute disgusting stuff that was, uh, that was in there from John Mark Carr, I, just, I couldn't handle a whole lot of it, but uh, I, I did go through enough to, to know that a lot of, a lot of times it seemed that, that Tracy was, um, was sort of spoon feeding 
uh, car information about the case. Right. Uh, and that's, and they're, can they're, I, may I interrupt no, just a second? And that's where the forms for justice uh, information that came out, we were able to prove that Michael Tracy had done this before, where he had named a suspect that wasn't a suspect at all. And um, so he, this is, and that, and that became a big story. So yeah, she, he, Tracy was spoon feeding him this information. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and some of the things dur during the course of the conference, uh, Lacey says that uh, it was, it was down to, well, there, there was a number of elements and I don't really want to go too deep into the, into the car mm -hmm. uh, story necessarily, but um all you had to do to be to be John Mark Carr is to have a loose understanding of some of the facts of the case, right? Um, and then uh, basically uh, fill in some sick fantasies that you have about little girls, mm -hmm. uh, and you present it to somebody such as a uh, uh, such as uh, such as Tracy, uh, and then uh, Tracy and so he could have presented it to some. He could have probably presented that easily to to like. For example, Lou Smith directly, right, uh, and, and he would have gotten the same thing. Some of these people were just so desperate uh, to to have anyone but the Ramses take yes. uh, take the hit for this. Uh, that's uh, and, and that's all it was. Like, uh, I'll just give you a, a one example, and it, this should have been enough to sort of say, okay, this guy is simply making this stuff up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, during one of the uh, exchanges uh, between Carr and Tracy, um, S Carr said that he placed underwear or quote knickers onto John oh, Bonet right. that he brought with him. And that he brought, that's right. That is just a flat out 100% it is, yeah. obvious lie because Patsy totally admitted that she bought that underwear for. Right. Uh, it's for in her niece, Jenny. Yes. For, yeah. for John Bonet's cousin. He didn't uh, need to make and, up that lie, but he did. Yes. Uh, and and it, it shows the, the, you know, how exactly how ignorant he is of some mm -hmm. fairly basic uh, facts of the case. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, that almost should have done it. And then there's other things. Uh, there was, they were stuck on the DNA. But uh, one of the other things that he said is that, uh, well, Kind of getting into some sick stuff here, but anyway, he said he he, he kissed John Bonet kind of all over, and he's mm -hmm. he's puzzled as to why you know they didn't sort of pick up um, you know his DNA should be there basically oh is God. what he said, and and uh. they did and they did body swabs of John Bonet, um, and and there was there was nothing. Um, yeah, he didn't he didn't indicate that she was um, that she was washed and redressed. No, uh, you know. Other than he seems to seems to think that it was it was uh, he that, that brought the uh, the underwear over, but yeah, and, so and like I say, if the more you, the more you uh, look into to what he exactly he told Tracy, um, I, I, it, it's it is actually mind boggling that law enforcement would have spent tens of thousands of dollars to bring this guy over from Thailand, first yeah. class, no less. Yeah, exactly. First class. I had caught. We could just go on and on and on. Just on my on my car. On John Carr alone, you know. So, Gene Panic, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, says, Trisha, my t shirt says, There was no intruder. Perfect. I love it. Thank you for the super chat, my dear. Uh, and again, I will be putting all the links to these videos that uh, Cynic has provided me and us in the description after the show tonight. So, I'll tell you what, let's get to uh, the DNA and then we're going to round it out with the uh, ransom note. And in between, we may uh, go off in, in little directions here and there. But I want to, um, I'm debating whether to play that six minute video. What do you think, Dan? Was that good, video good enough to play? The six minute one? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Now I do have to stop it occasionally and say something. So um, I may just stop it and go say something and then continue on. And that way, uh, YouTube's, you know, little bots won't pick up on it because you can't play like a full video like that on YouTube. So hang on here. Let me get it real quick. OK, everybody, this is a 12 minute video, but please watch it. If you have any questions about the DNA, if you think, oh, my gosh, they have intruder DNA, they do not. 
And we're going to go into it even more in depth after this video. Now, this is from Nine News, and it says it's from six years ago. But again, I'll have to stop it, uh, you know, every so often and, and say something because that's just the YouTube rules. So let me share this. And uh, oops, a daisy. Let's see here. Now, I played about half of it the other night to kind of give you a little a little tease of what we we're going to be doing. But this is uh, we're going to play the whole thing tonight under YouTube rules. So here we go. The anniversary of Colorado's most infamous unsolved killing. We've seen a deluge of television specials and investigations. But Nine Wants to Know decided to focus on the one piece of evidence heralded as key to solving this crime, DNA that's been in the FBI's national database since 2003, DNA that Boulder's former district attorney is certain belongs to the killer. But now a Nine News Boulder Daily Camera investigation found it's evidence that may be worth in terms of solving this case, putting that DNA in doubt. It's a murder with two competing theories. John Benet Ramsey was either killed on Christmas night 1996 by someone in her family, or she was killed by an intruder. For more than a decade, those theories played out in the tabloids, on talk radio, even inside the investigation. Then on July 9th, 2008, attorney says new DNA evidence in the murder of Jamine Ramsey. Boulder District Attorney Mary Lacey fully embraced the, the intruder Ramsey theory. Clears her family of any involvement in her death. That just baffled my mind. Shocking fellow prosecutors. I wouldn't have done it because I don't think that's the role of the district attorney. Her successor. I was stunned. I, I was also appalled. And even the Colorado governor who assembled a task force to look into the case. I couldn't see any reason based on what she said for her to do so. Had never seen anything like that in the past from any other prosecutor and just couldn't believe she chose to do that. Lacey's decision was based on DNA she said was conclusive. DNA she said John Bonet's killer left behind on her panties and long johns. DNA that would crack the case if it could just be identified or matched. But the actual DNA test results Mary Lacey used to clear the Ramseys, obtained exclusively by Nine News and the Boulder Daily Camera, tell a very different story. So I was always surprised at what she did, and now I'm deeply concerned. Okay, we need to stop here. YouTube rules. He's deeply concerned. Let's hear the rest of it. It's the latest controversy in a case full of problems. A bungled crime scene, infighting among investigators and prosecutors. First of all, many of you know that last week... A decision by former District Attorney Alex Hunter to drop charges authorized by a grand jury against John and Patsy Ramsey. Mary Lacey succeeded Hunter in 2001 with a reputation as a strong supporter of the intruder theory. When she issued her exoneration letter and apologized to the Ramseys, she created the impression that if someone could just identify the person whose DNA profile had been found, the case would be solved. We now have pretty irrefutable DNA evidence, according to the DA's office. No, you don't. Continue on. And that's the most significant thing to me. And certainly we are grateful that they acknowledge that we, you know, based on that, certainly could not have been involved. So we had D8, D21. Nine wants to know, and the daily camera took those same lab results to forensic experts. Yeah. The first time that data had ever been independently evaluated. And those experts agreed. The DNA results don't come close to proving that an intruder killed John Bonet. It's certainly possible that an intruder was responsible for the murder, but I don't think that the DNA evidence proves it. The only way I can describe this evidence is uninformative. It really is, it's not dispositive of the presence of a perpetrator. There is foreign DNA, but that foreign DNA can easily be accounted for by a number of innocent mechanisms. Male DNA was originally identified in John Bonet's underwear during testing in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Lacey ordered new tests in 2007 and 2008 on John Bonet's long johns and nightgown. 
It's those tests that led Lacey to exonerate the Ramses. I can tell you in my experience. A decision that confounded Troy Ide, a former. Yeah, a decision that confounded everybody, especially when you hear what we're going to tell you about that DNA. It's not just one person. Continue on. A U.S. attorney who was on the Ramsey task force appointed by Governor Owens. There's a real danger whenever you say, OK, we've looked at this and we've categorically determined something. The experts who reviewed the DNA test data for Nine News and the Daily Camera questioned Lacey's exoneration on multiple fronts. First, the DNA profile Lacey said belonged to the killer may not be the profile of a single person. There is a reasonable uh, chance that what has been um, attributed to a single individual actually represents DNA from multiple individuals that has been, that has been sort of um, uh, hobbled together into a single profile. Well, it's a rather obvious point, but I mean, if you're looking for somebody who doesn't exist because it's actually several people, it's, it's a problem. And as for the DNA on the Long Johns, heralded by Lacey as conclusive, our experts believe those two spots are mixtures of genetic material from more than two people. Did, you, did everybody hear that? A mixture of more than two people. Now, Lacey didn't say anything about that, did she? Here we go looks and appears to me to be at least three individuals. And so that there's a mixture here that's not just a single profile. Which is precisely what Mary Lacey knew before she exonerated the Ramses. This report, obtained by Nine News and the Daily Camera, went to Lacey's office three months before she cleared the family. Of the two spots on John Bonet's Long Johns, the report says it's likely more than two people contributed to the mixtures. And after eliminating John Bonet's DNA, the remaining DNA contribution should not be considered a single source profile. She knew based on your investigation that this DNA wasn't necessarily from one person and that it in fact was potentially accumulated DNA. She knew it at the time and why she used this evidence to clear the Ramsey family then, a clearance that has continued because it's on the public record through today is is something I, I can't explain and she should explain. Mary Lee. Uh, Senate, are you, are you there? I didn't mute you, did I? Hold on. No, nope, sorry, I'm here. Um, you know, I, I love what this guy said. We're going to get back to it, where he said <laughs> she knew. She knew it was at least three people and it was a mixture of DNA, and she knew this before doing that stupid exoneration letter saying that there was the DNA of the killer, leading everyone to think there was just one person. What is wrong with her mind? You got to help me understand this. Yeah, she knew actually, I think it was about three or four months before uh, she did her little public exoneration. Uh, move with the uh, with the Ramses. So uh, it wasn't a sort of a snap decision. She certainly had time to, you know, to, to consider carefully what she was about to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but she just went ahead and did it. And uh, it, it goes back to, uh, to what Kohler said when, uh, in, for, I'm sure people remember this in his book, uh, those who've read it, that uh, when he did uh, his presentation uh, to to her um, with regard to the direction of the case, and he was looking to to get uh, the medical records of, of Burke uh, Burke Ramsey, and uh, you know at that point she just said, well, you know, uh, essentially paraphrasing heavily here, but uh, essentially that uh, she didn't want to harm her relationship uh, with uh, with the Ramseys. It just makes me sick. We're, okay, we're going to continue on. That's probably the best explanation there can be. Uh, okay, hang tight. Here we go. Lacey never responded to our questions about her decision to exonerate the Ramses. She left office in 2009, and she didn't respond to our calls, our emails, our letters, or our visits to her Boulder home. And if you think it looks like she set out to prove the intruder theory, you are not alone. Independent experts who reviewed the case told Nine Wants to Know in the Boulder Daily Camera they think Lacey succumbed to a phenomenon well known in human psychology. Understanding the DNA evidence in the murder of John Benet Ramsey means understanding this. Everywhere we go, we leave little bits of ourselves. Merely talking for 15 to 30 seconds 
is enough to detect a DNA profile on the desk in front of you. That reality challenges one of the central tenets of the DNA evidence in the John Benet Ramsey case. One made public when former Boulder District Attorney Mary Lacey exonerated the Ramsey family in 2008, saying that there's no innocent explanation for genetic material found in the girl's underwear and long johns. My guess is that if we took your shirt and uh, did some DNA testing on it at the level of sensitivity involved in this case, we'd find your DNA, we'd probably find some other people's DNA on there as well. Lacey's exoneration letter said she had concluded that foreign DNA on John Bonet's clothing could not have gotten there inadvertently. And that is just flat out wrong. And for her to make that statement like she's a DNA expert is unforgivable. Here we go. Something our experts say is just not true. They say there are plenty of reasons the DNA on John Bonet's clothing could be innocent. Reasons that have nothing to do with murder. You shed 40,000 cells per hour. You are leaving your DNA everywhere. When, when, you know, wherever you go physically, you're leaving a small part of yourself. Mary Lacey discounted that possibility when she issued her letter exonerating the Ramseys and concluding the DNA must be the killers. I thought that was a bit of a leap to claim that uh, there couldn't be an innocent explanation for what, it, what was found. How did Lacey's conclusion differ so much from the actual DNA tests? Lacey was long known to support the theory that an intruder, not a family member, killed John Bonet. Something our experts believe could have led her to succumb to what's known as confirmation bias. In human psychology, um, we like to see patterns. We like uh, to see puzzle pieces uh, fitted together. Confirmation bias can affect how an investigator with a theory interprets evidence. You tend to believe data, which confirms your hypothesis. You tend to think of explanations to refute data, which do not support your hypothesis. Case in that's very interesting. There's an actual phenomenon uh, known by psychologists th of this type of thing. Uh, and uh, Cynic, you were going to say something? Uh, I just had a couple of, uh, there is actually, I'm not sure where during what uh, particular interview this was, but uh, this is from, I think this was from Kohler's book. Anyway, uh, Lacey attempts to explain. I uh, said, here's what I was doing with the exoneration letter. I was trying to prevent a horrible travesty of justice. I was scared to death that despite the fact that there was no evidence, no psychopathy, and no motive, the case was a train, uh, the case was like a train going down the track and the Ramseys were tied to that track. And then uh, another little quote here, people who worked with Lacey remember her bringing John Ramsey into the Boulder County Prosecutor's Office around the time she exonerated the family. She wanted all of us to shake hands with him. We didn't know what to say. It was like an apology to her, said one of Lacey's former DA investigators, Gordon Coons. That's disgusting. And if you remember in James Kohler's book, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, basically anything that pointed to the Ramseys as a you know possible suspect was not like, it was just piled up and it was, you know, messy and, and she didn't want to hear it. You know, yeah. she didn't want to do what every investigator that has any sort of decency would do. And that is work from the inside out. You go yeah. with the people closest to them and then you work out. And she refused. What, and that's, that. you know, one of the, probably the main reasons why James Kohler uh, quit and wrote the book. Yeah. So. Okay, let's yeah. continue on. I was just, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, Lacey knew she had very little time uh, at the mm -hmm. time she uh, at the time she exonerated the Ramseys in terms of uh, basically getting them off the hook, and uh, she she went for it. Um, yeah, I think she had about two years left in her term, something like that, if, uh, if I recall correctly. So right. yeah, it's it's uh, and she didn't know who was necessarily going to come after her. Um, it, you know, she knew that she was probably going to be, or, or she could potentially be the last of the, of the people that were just crazily bent on, uh, on, on clearing the Ramses. So mm -hmm. I would say, it doesn't matter what the facts were. I'm going to clear the Ramses. Uh, if it's the last thing I do, it seems to be the attitude for sure. Right. Facts be damned. Okay. Continue yep. on here. We have about uh, four minutes left. Point. These never before seen emails. They show that after preliminary tests found the presence of unknown male DNA on John Bonet's long johns, an investigator in Lacey's office replied that his bosses didn't see the need 
for additional testing. It sounds like they got a result that they were looking for and decided to quit while they were ahead. The lab that Lacey used later provided her with reports showing that the unknown DNA on the Long Johns was likely part of a mixture of genetic material from more than two people, but that was never before made public until now. She issued her exoneration in spite of the confusing DNA results, an exoneration the family still points to as proof they were not involved. Just last month, Ramsey lawyer Lynn Wood used the exoneration to challenge news reports suggesting it could be a family member who killed John Bonet. And, and let's stop right there. Lynn Wood has lost his mind, everybody. <laughs> he's gone off the deep end. He's, he's claiming that Trump is still in office. Um, you know, he's lost uh, his, uh, I think he may have lost his law license or it's in the process. I'm not sure. Or he should at least anyway. And, um, you know, he said he's a, he's a crazy QAnon person, but more crazy than normal QAnon people. I, I mean, right, right, Cynic? Oh, yeah, he's pretty much, uh, I don't know, I guess a, a superstar in the QAnon community. He is now, yeah, but uh, no longer the Ramsey attorney. So he, no. his help is is uh, no longer there for them. Here we go. It, it's a uh, tweet said in 2008. Boulder oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Cynic. <laughs> no, I was just going to say I found it amusing. I listened to uh, the interview uh, John Ramsey on on Megyn Kelly's show, mm -hmm. <laughs> and back in the day, uh, the Ramseys would have no problems using uh, Lynn Wood's uh, name. But I noticed during the uh, that particular interview, it just said our lawyer. I, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> They're <laughs> not, not mentioned. Say. No, it's it is funny. It, it's it is it's. I, and again, it's almost like this this karma. It's like, see, we knew Lynn Wood had issues, and now he's proved it to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. The DA publicly exonerated them and apologized. DNA evidence conclusive. End of story. And in another tweet, he said, this is a DNA case, plain and simple. No, it is not. It's clearly not. Uh, we have a, a question profile that uh, that is very low level in terms of the amount of DNA, the quantity of DNA is very small. The profile is extremely complex. Um, the one thing this case is not, it is not a DNA case, pure and simple. The problem with the Ramsey case is not that we don't have enough opinions. Current DA Stan Garnett stopped short of calling for new testing of the DNA when we showed him what we found. But our experts say if he did, scientists could isolate out male genetic material and make it easier to determine exactly what the DNA might mean in this case. I'm not gonna say what we're gonna do. What I will tell you and, and it will assure the public is any uh, reasonable effort that can be done to evaluate the evidence and evaluate whether charges can be filed is being done by my office with the Boulder police and will be in the future. Based on our findings, Boulder authorities started talking about what to do. And Nine News and the Daily Camera learned Boulder police and prosecutors met and decided it's time for a new round of DNA testing. And uh, again, this is from six years ago, everybody. Here we go. What we're focusing on is uh, solving the case and proving the case, as you know, um, it's been 20 years and that's not happened. It's Boulder County District Attorney Stan Garnett's job to file charges against whoever killed that six-year-old girl in December 1996, if and when the evidence supports it. And now his office is working with Boulder police to plan a new round of DNA tests. Certainly the Ramsey case, there's a whole lot more to that, to that case than DNA. DNA is a part of it. We gotta make sure that it's tested, tested appropriately through up-to-date modern methods. Uh, and we will make sure that happens. The move comes after a joint Nine News daily camera investigation found all kinds of problems with the DNA testing of John Bonet's underwear and long johns. Former DA Mary Lacey cleared the girl's family of suspicion based on that testing. But our investigation showed that male DNA on the girl's clothes may have been left innocently. May not and there you go. That's that's the number one thing right there. Okay, we have one minute left. Here we go. Not belong to the killer and may not even be from a single person. Our story led to a meeting in recent weeks among prosecutors, police, and Colorado Bureau of Investigation agents. They discussed new technology and new testing. Garnett would not guess on a timeline. It's been 20 years of an ongoing investigation, so I understand the curiosity that people have. CBI is efficient, they're careful, they're deliberate, um, and I'm sure they'll move forward 
in it with an appropriate uh, amount of speed. We don't know what kind of testing they're going to do, but our experts have an idea. Submit JonBenet's undergarments to testing that focuses only on male DNA. That way scientists could determine if that genetic mixture contains DNA from more than one man. And knowing that would tell investigators whether that profile that's been in the FBI's database since 2003 really is the killers. And, and Dan, we know it's not because there's, there's more to this. It's, there's more um, to uh, the, the fact that he, that, is there even enough left to test Sinek? Is there enough DNA left? Well, that's, that's a million dollar question. Uh, it's, it's very possible that there, uh, that there isn't any more. Uh, certainly, there may not be any more left in terms of the, uh, the DNA from the, uh, from the one uh, blood spot that was, uh, was developed and ultimately uh, profile uh, uploaded from that particular uh, spot. And that seems to, from what I've been able to gather, that seems to be um, the, the most plentiful uh, of DNA and sort of uh, the least, the least problematic. The the mm -hmm. DNA uh, for the DNA profiles, for example, that the the Bodhi Labs developed from the from the Long Johns, the right and the left side, uh, that was pretty pretty messed up. Um, the I, I think one side especially was pretty messed up. Uh, and the, and the nightgown, the they tested the uh, the nightgown that was found uh, as well beside John Bonet. Uh, the DNA there was uh, also pretty problematic. So I, I know uh, Othram, uh, Othram Labs can do some some pretty some pretty cool stuff with mm -hmm. uh, with DNA testing uh, because they use. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a snip based uh, look that they have at the DNA, uh, so it's it's not um, like the typical S STR uh, based uh, testing, which requires the DNA to be a lot better in in terms of uh, quality and quantity. Um, so perhaps, as I say, perhaps Authram could do something with it. But uh, you know that that said. Uh, some of the labs, uh, some of the labs, the government labs, um, uh, uh, for example, the Denver, uh, the Denver CBI labs, they're, they have some great, you know, great techniques. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if they, if they rival uh, Othram, say, for example, at this point, but, um, you know, they're very capable of, of, of utilizing whatever is left, uh, if there is anything left. And uh, say, for example, uh, submit a profile to somebody that could take a uh, look at it in terms of investigative uh, genetic genealogy uh, and, and see if they could come up with uh, something there. But, uh, you know, for, for those people that seem to think that, again, that the, the, the Boulder police are, are stonewalling the investigation, that they, they don't want this to, to go any further, they're happy with the case as it is well then i you know I, I don't know what to tell you because obviously uh the the boulder police i think we mentioned on the last show i mean these people would be hailed as as heroes if they if they came up with uh well, exactly with, with something there there's you know there'd be a ticker tape parade for these for these guys there, there's just no reason for them to to not wish to um submit any and all evidence for as much uh and as thorough testing as is possible um, and right yeah. uh and uh insightful one do you have any questions from chat oh i've got her muted i guess that wouldn't help would it oh you gotta i think you have to unmute yourself insightful one inside there you yes, go yes i do <laughs> <laughs> My button's that's stuck. Okay. That's okay. Oh, and by the way, um, oh, soon as there's a frog, Damn and uh, there's like 300 of them where she lives. She sleeps <laughs> with the frogs. You know how some people sleep with the oh. fishes? She sleeps with the frogs. That's all we can tell you. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I wrote them down. Jean Panic asks, were there fibers from Patsy's clothes found on the duct tape? Yes. Sinek, there were. Yes. And where, yes. where, what were those fibers? Um, that I will come back to in a second. I will find the exact information. Okay. 
and we'll get we'll get back to that. And uh, okay, insightful one. Go ahead. Mike Mig says, "Why won't they release the rest of the indictment? Only four pages of eighteen released." Well, that's something that um, uh, that the whites were. Uh, we're very interested in having uh, having happen, uh, and they did uh, do, go through some legal hoops to try to make it happen, but they were ultimately uh, turned down. Um, and and no one else seems to be interested in in perhaps taking that on, um, because it, you know it, it was a fair it was a fairly um, lengthy and nasty process just to get what was released released, um, but. You know, perhaps if somebody certainly wants to take that up, that would be very, very welcome by uh, by a lot of people if that were to happen. Uh, Cynic, if I had the money, I swear, swear to you, that is the one thing I would do. Mm -hmm. I would, I would take a hundred a million dollars and go to court and try and get as much from the grand jury released, anything from the DA's office that we could get. Yes. I would do that in a heartbeat. Okay, insightful one. Any more questions, my darling? Um, it's not a specific or from a specific person, but the mm -hmm. underwear John Bonet was wearing has been mentioned a lot. So I was gonna ask for everybody. Did Patsy say she changed John Bonet's underwear that night and that's why the bigger ones were on or no? She said she did not. Thank you. People are asking so. Okay. Right. Supposedly the intruder went in and got these uh, huge pairs of underwear that were going to go to Patsy's niece, I believe. And we actually have yes. pictures yep. to show you uh, the size difference here. Yeah, this you should just, show those. Yeah, this is just absolutely ridiculous. And while I do that, Cynic, if you could look up that uh, one quote that you were looking for. And everybody talk amongst yourselves, please. Listen, <laughs> let's listen to the lovely frog in uh, Insightful One's uh, bedroom. I think this is in her bedroom. I, oh, I think she left <laughs> him in her house, actually, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> All right, I've got uh, some information regarding the fibers. This is from uh, James Kohler's book. I'll just read a little passage here. Uh, Trujillo, one of the detectives, Boulder Police Department advised me that lab technicians had identified eight different types of fibers on the sticky side of the duct tape used to cover John Bonet's mouth. They included red acrylic, gray acrylic, and red polyester fibers that were subsequently determined by lab examination the microscopically and chemically consistent to each other, as well as the fibers taken from Patsy Ramsey's essentials jacket. Further, fibers from this jacket were also matched to trace fibers collected from the wrist ligature, neck ligature, and vacuumed evidence from the paint tray and wine cellar floor. Uh, wow. Let's see, is there more? <laughs> That paint tray, by the way, was reported to have been moved to the basement about a month prior to the kidnapping, and investigators doubted that Patsy would have been working on art projects while wearing the, that particular dress jacket. Uh, the collection of jacket fibers from all of these different locations raised strong suspicions about her involvement in the crime. And that's about it in terms of uh, the duct tape. Right. What was on the duct tape? Did you say that? I, I'm sorry. I'm down. No, I, I said, no, that was, that was it as far as uh, oh, the fibers okay. on the duct tape. Okay. Let me show you a couple of pictures here about this underwear. So you can see how ridiculous this is. Okay. Now, supposedly the intruder, while everybody slept, uh, went upstairs, found this package of underwear, which I believe was in John Bonet's room, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Cynic? Yes. And well, oh, go ahead. It was it, in terms of going through, there was some speculation that it could have been in um, Patsy said it was in uh, in her room in, in her dresser and mm -hmm. that uh, John Bonet essentially, uh, you know, liked it and chose to, to wear it. Um, there were some gifts uh, that were found partially uh, open in the uh, in the wine cellar room. Mm -hmm. uh, some have some have speculated that 
that you know maybe it was, because it was those were intended to be a gift uh, for for Patsy's uh, niece, but yeah, so that, that's where it all kind of gets a little fuzzy. Uh, you know, they could have been right. uh, they could have been there and it could have been removed uh, from one of the, the gift boxes, uh, or you know, as I say, it's, regardless, uh, they were not ever meant for John Bonet. Obviously, they're they're clearly far too large. Mm -hmm. And Patsy gets into quite a song and dance in terms of uh, how she answers questions during the various law enforcement interviews Talk in terms of, this. you know, yeah, why they were, uh, why, you know, John Bonet ended up having those particular items on. And she, she, she has some, some, some crazy uh, uh, answers uh, that people would find quite incredible as, as you, if they were to, to read through. Um, but yeah, uh, I can actually bring up a little bit of that. Oh, if you could. And and everybody, I'm going to put a link to the police videos uh, in the description when, when this is over, when, when the show is over. But I mean, come on. Would an intruder spend the time? And, and first of all, why would these big, huge pants be in John Bonet's room? I think that's baloney. I think they're in Patsy's room. I think Patsy grabbed them to redress her and... Um, it just tried to blame it on the intruder. Why would an intruder do that? My God, you would get in and get out. And we don't, we're, haven't even gotten to the ransom note yet. And that'll be coming up right after this. Yeah, I've uh, got a few notes regarding this. Uh, as, I, as I went through, I found that uh, Patsy, in my opinion, at least, lied at least three times during the course of questioning regarding the, uh, the panties. Uh, she tried to say that uh, Jenny, the Bernice, Mm -hmm. was, quote, a little girl and implied <laughs> that her panty size would not be terribly dissimilar to that of John Bonet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, she tried to say that she commonly bought size 8 to 10 panties for John Bonet, thereby making the size 12 to 14 panties seem a little less unusual. But when police uh, looked through um, the, the drawers the, uh, after, uh, the, during the course of their... Uh, uh, their search warrants, uh, they did not find that the only thing that they found uh, were the, the common, the, the size four to six. Right. For John, that's all they ever found. Uh, and she's tried to say that the size 12 to 14 panties were, quote, only a little big. Let me show you something. Uh, this was done by one of our great members on forumsforjustice.org. She made paper mache legs of her six year old. Uh, niece or, or I can't remember who it was. So she made uh, of, uh, look, the, the average size of a six-year-old, she made these paper mache legs. Okay. And then she put that size underwear on, on the paper mache legs. And I'm going to show it to you right now. Now you tell me, Patsy Ramsey bought those underwear occasionally for John Bonet because they weren't that much bigger. I mean, look at that. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And of course, she wasn't uh, the person that did this was not going to have a six year old model. So that's why she did the paper mache. But I mean, right there, people. And here Patsy is saying, oh, yeah, well, they weren't that much different in size. And neat. you guys, I, I'm starting to lose my mind even more. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, the person that, that did this uh, poster's name was JLs. Yes. Uh, she said that uh, when she asked, um, her daughter to try them on said my daughter laughed when I showed her the the big knickers for the first time I called her into my study and held out one pair to watch her reaction she looked at them and started giggling I asked her what have I got here and she said they're huge they're like your pants she's giggling <laughs> because they were identical and designed to a pair she already owns there's no way she would ever mistake these for her own when I asked her to try them on she found it hilarious a big joke I can assure you that there's no way she would wear them you look ridiculous and it would be extremely uncomfortable because of the size of the leg holes. The crotch is way too long for a little girl and because the waistband is so slack, they would tend to swivel around and slip down. Yeah, that's right. It was her yeah. daughter. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, Senek, if you could send me that link to that uh, post, that'd be great. And I'll put it up in the, uh, in the description as well. And if you ever get a chance, everybody go to forumsforjustice.org. There's some outdated stuff on there. But uh, that was the, the first forum that I owned, which leapfrogged into uh, Web Sleuths. But we have got some of the 
greatest posters on there that uh, like jails who, who did who went to all this trouble to do this to show how ridiculous it was for Patsy to say that she just kept lying and uh, I'm sorry I know I'm losing my mind okay <laughs> let, me, let me hide these so we've got the underpants cleared up actually the next thing I want to take uh, real quickly and then we'll get to the uh, ransom note and that is was John Bonet sexually assaulted or not? Now, uh, insightful one, I know this is one of your questions, and I'm going to put up a, a chart that Cynic sent me. So hold on, let me get that. And insightful one, if you could ask your question, that would be great. If you can, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if you have your notes in front of you, and I, I should have warned you I was going to go there. So. Oh yeah, it's fine. Um. So my question is, because I figure you'd know more than we know, obviously. Um, I think it was John Meyer who originally examined her, said it was inconclusive, and he brought in an expert from the university to look, and he said inconclusive. Dr. Leon Kelly, who is a pathologist with expertise in child abuse, said there was no scarring and no healing injuries. Um, and that there was a pathologist that had said, the only thing she said was in her heart, she feels John Bonet was abused. Then there was another one who believed she was abused, but later found out that she had been diagnosed previously with vaginitis, but wasn't aware of that at the time he decided that. Do you know anything else about that? You know, the, if there was abuse or not. Well, I've only ever most most of what I've uh, come to to learn of of the case is seems pretty troubling, uh, and I think if uh, I, I'm sure Steve Thomas has a pretty good recollection of um, there was a there was a presentation uh, given in which uh, the the detectives went over sort of all the evidence that they had gathered up to up to a particular point and this was shortly before the uh before the grand jury um came to convene um and detective um harmer which -E -E uh was sort of one of the ones looking at the sexual abuse aspect and uh I i've made a a few notes with respect to, to john benet um and, and this and it's You'll you'll have bits of this in, in pretty much most of the the major books on the, on the case. There, Steve Thomas has a section. Uh, James Kohler has a section. Uh, there's a little bit, I think, even in uh, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, and and some other books um, as well. Uh, one thing that I think a lot of people are fairly uh, familiar with is the fact that she seems to have uh, John Bidet had a lot of visits uh, to to the doctor's office. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, it's been counted to be uh, 33 visits to the Boulder pediatrician in three years. And the doctor also received three calls from Patsy on December 17th uh, for some reason that's uh, presently unknown. Um, so that's that's a bit concerning. Um, detective, in terms of the presentation, and so as I say, it's certainly something that Steve probably recalls probably for even fairly vividly. Let's say in, from his book, it says, Detective Harmer presented a surprising anatomy lesson on vaginas to a meeting attended primarily by men. She showed a picture of the vagina of a normal, healthy six-year-old girl and contrasted it with a photo of the vagina of John Bonet. Even to the uninformed, the visual difference was apparent, and Harmer cited the experts who said there was evidence of chronic sexual abuse, although detectives referred to it only as prior vaginal trauma. Um, given the medical opinions of, primer, of prior vaginal trauma, uh, the night of the murder must not have been the intruder's first vis visit unless the vaginal abuse and the murder were done and, by different people. Uh, yes. I, need, I need to interrupt you real quick. Um, I accidentally timed somebody out. Can, can oh. somebody untime out Miss C.D. Isaacs? I did not mean to do that. I'm sorry, Cynic, go ahead. Okay. Uh, from, from Kohler's book, it's a Dr. Meyer was concerned um, about John Bonet's vaginal injuries, and he, along with uh, with Boulder investigators, sought the opinions of a variety of other physicians in the days following her autopsy. 
Uh, Dr. Sarantak, a, a pediatrician with Denver Children's Hospital, recognized signs of prior sexual trauma, but neither he nor Dr. Meyer were able to say with any degree of certainty what period of time may have been involved in the abuse. Experts in their field, physicians and forensic pathologists, were consulted from St. Louis, Missouri, from St. Louis, Missouri, Dade County, Florida, Wayne County, Michigan, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to name just a few. They examined the series of photographs that depicted the injuries and came to the opinion that John Bonet had been subjected to sexual intrusion prior to the in insertion of the foreign object that had created the injury at the time of her death. It was their opinion that the type of injury present with the hymen suggested that several different contacts had been made in the past and the digital penetration was consistent with this type of injury. The physicians were unable to date the previous injury or specific uh, quantity, the number of times a uh, job had been assaulted, but were confident in their opinions that she had been subjected to sexual contact prior to the day of the murder. The particular information suggested that someone close to John Bonet had been responsible for abusing her in the weeks or months preceding the murder. As is often the case involving this type of childhood abuse, investigators had to consider the possibility that a family member, relative, or someone close to the inner circle of the family was responsible for the prior acts and possibly the murder of John Bonet. Somebody had to have access to John Bonet on repeated occasionally to have, uh, pay, repeated occasions to have perpetrated these injuries. And uh, as I say, that's um, there. There was a there was essentially a panel of experts that uh, the Boulder police uh, were responsible in in gathering together, and um, and along with uh, the the uh, uh, pathologist's office. And you know, certainly my understanding and the understanding presented in in a number of books is that they all thought that there was evidence of chronic sexual abuse. As I say, the, the only disagreement was in terms of, uh, as, as was just read there, uh, that in terms of, you know, when and, uh, you know, how many times and sort of what could have, you know, was it just sort of digital penetration and what it was, but it was, uh, uh, it, it was not any sort of penile, uh, uh, penile uh, intrusion. And that's about as far as I, that's sort of my understanding of, uh, of things. And uh, I think somebody like uh, Kohler could, you know, may have more information that he didn't perhaps put in his book. And certainly probably somebody like Steve Thomas is also aware, but uh, I think certainly a lot of people within the Boulder police department uh, and probably Meyer himself uh, would, would probably be of the opinion that there was some, um, that, that she was, uh, sexually abused uh, in, in, in the past prior to the acute injury that she suffered uh, that night. Uh, can you explain uh, the chart that I've put up here? Sure. In the autopsy report, um, it says that it gives a size. Uh, let's see, bring up the picture here. In the autopsy report, it gives the size of, uh, of John Bonet's um, uh, vaginal opening, mm -hmm. um, concealed, you know, uh, in, in terms of the of the in terms of the hymenal covering, um, and it's it indicates that the, the diameter is, is 10, 10 millimeters. Uh, in the chart that's there, uh, this was this was a chart developed by uh, people looking at. Uh, uh, children that have uh, been been traumatized by sexual abuse, and they've looked. Uh, I guess during during the course of their investigations, uh, they measured the hymenal openings of uh, of these children, and they came up with uh, with a range. So, if you depending on the age of the person there, so at the bottom the bottom axis there, you've got the age one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so there's a line going up to uh, what the hymen opening, the average was for a six-year-old, uh, and it is around five. Um, but you could also see if you just go up that green line, going up to the black uh, line, you could see that all those little dots there, those are all uh, various opening sizes. So you can see that uh, essentially, you know, things kind of cut off at that point there. Uh, like the, the very highest point for a six-year-old would be about just, it looks like about maybe 5.3 or 5.4, whereas to say John Bidet being 10, but you can see that there were plenty of other girls that, that uh, were abused that had far, far less 
So John Bonet would be so far outside the norm that I, I guess that would be consistent with uh, with that little segment that I read from Steve Thomas's book yes. when when Harmer presented it that it was just obvious to more or less anybody looking at it that this is just clearly an unusual opening size for uh, for a girl that age. And, and Cynic, don't you think too it probably would have been a battle of the experts if this had ever gone to trial anyway? Oh sure, oh sure, you know? yeah. yeah. And, and that's the thing. So, okay, uh, insightful one. Does that help? I hope. Yeah, you know her uh, pediatrician, Francesco Buff. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. He sits there and denies that there was anything, but mm -hmm. I don't know if he would say if there was because then that makes him look incompetent. And would sure. he have to report it sure. if there was? Yep. Yep. Yeah, he'd have to yep. report it by law. Right, exactly. Okay, let me remove this. And now we are going to get to the coup de gras. And I hope I said that right. You did. That's what my mom used to say. Uh, and we are going to, uh, let's see here, let me remove this. Talk about the ransom note, because here's the deal. My darling true crime angels. We don't know what happened that night. And I am not going to point a finger at anybody because I don't know. What I do believe very deeply within the heart of my soul. And again, if you put a gun to my head and said, you have to be right, was there or was there not an intruder? I would say there was not, absolutely not an intruder. Why? Because Patsy wrote the note. If you want to dismiss the DNA, uh, if you want to, you know, just it to you, it may just sound like white noise. One thing to remember, you will never hear John talk about the ransom note unless he's asked and it will be a quick question and he'll move on never in depth. And tonight we're going to show you some things. Now, the, the one of the problems is, and I think we're going to get into this tonight, Cynic, is one of the uh, people examining the note said it was 100% Patsy Ramsey. And you can't say that in handwriting, uh, in the handwriting business. You can't come up and say it's 100%. It will never be 100%. There will always be a slight percent that it could be somebody else. But when you hear and see what Sina Wong has done with this note, it's just common sense. I'm not asking you to do uh, mental gymnastics here to try, you know, let me back up. When we do woo woo Saturday nights where we tell ghost stories and everything, I'm always doing mental gymnastics, trying to make it look like a ghost. But I know damn well it isn't. OK. In this case, there are no mental gymnastics needed. You just need to look at it with your own eyes. That's it. OK, so. Uh, Cynic, sh should we start with the interview with Sina Wong? Do you think that would be a, a good way to go? I would say so. Okay, let's do that. Let me grab that really quickly here. And, and if you hear snorting, it's not me. I'm not snorting. It's uh, Bug Nugget. Othram, Texas, Bug Nugget the first. He snorts when he's sleeping, and he's sleeping right next to me. So, But the frogs are living with Insightful One. She sleeps with them because they're so darn cute. Where did they go, Insightful One? I'm in my room. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, they seem to, to croak right at the right time, like an exclamation point. Like Patsy wrote the note. Ribbit, 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 ribbit. I mean, they, they, know. <laughs> they know, they know, they know. Phineas okay. is being extra loud tonight, so I had to leave. <laughs> Who is? Phineas. Remember the frog? Who the frog? We named him Phineas, Chad, and what was the last name? Potter. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me find Cena. Okay. I think this is Cena here. Yeah. This is Cena. Okay. Let me do this. Ba 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 ba. Uh, Cynic, I sing and annoy everybody when I'm uh, putting stuff together. So just bear with <laughs> me. Bear with me. Okay. Let me get to comments here. There we go. And. We're going to share this screen. Uh, 
And this is Sina Wong. I'm not sure how long ago this was. Uh, but the thing is, doesn't matter because this is hardcore evidence that doesn't change. OK, so here we go. Professionally speaking, how certain are you that Patsy Ramsey wrote this ransom note? It's highly probable that she wrote the ransom note. Sina Wong has testified in more than 60 trials. She says she compared that ransom note with more than 100 samples of Patsy Ramsey's handwriting. She created these charts. First of all, here are some similarities. Claiming she found substantial similarities with the way certain letters were formed, such as these A's. And so you will see that just with the A's, the, the ransom note writer has four different variations of the letter A. And then Patsy Ramsey uses the same variation of the four different types of A's. In total, she says she found over 200 similarities in the writing, including unique ways letter combinations were formed. On the first example, you'll see that when the letter T and E are written together, they connect, they touch. And on the second one, it's called a misplaced capital. There's a capital L in the middle of it and the word will, and you'll see that there's a capital L. So this L is Patsy's handwriting. This is the, the ransom, ransom note. Right. When the word unharmed is written, you'll see that this, the A, that this portion of it is up above. It's higher than the hump of the H. Hmm. And that happens in both cases. Yes. But Wong's analysis, which she prepared in connection with the civil lawsuit against the Ramses, was never allowed in court. Okay, that's, that's where it ended. Cynic thoughts. Well, as we covered in the last show to some degree, I, I mentioned that uh, Cena had access to uh, how many documents she had access to. She had, um, oh, escapes me now, but I know she found 243 similarities between uh, the exemplars, uh, the writings that uh, she received uh, that were, were ultimately came from, from various um, police requests of, of, uh, of Patsy Ramsey, of both uh, writing samples and also uh, from um, material that she had written, um, you know, prior to uh, December the, the 26th. So uh, she had access to she didn't just, you know, hop on, hop on the web and uh, check out, uh, you know, some of the things that were kicking around from uh, from the Enquirer and that type of thing. She had um, mm -hmm. the actual actual material, actual exemplars from from Patsy Ramsey, genuine materials, uh, which, you know, the uh, from time to time you see things on the internet and so and so says, well, you know, I think this this handwriting is similar to, you know, to you know, whoever, uh, there were some people that went on the record saying that uh, uh, the John Mark Carr's writing had, you know, had some some degree of, res of resemblance. And these were clearly people that, well, A, didn't have access to, uh, to anything um, legitimate as far as exemplars. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were going by such a small sample in, in order to get any sort of a, of, of a proper opinion in terms of whether somebody uh, was responsible for writing a particular document, you, you need to have a lot to compare with. And, and that's what Sina had. Um, her, the, the level, the, the depth that she went uh, to in terms of her analysis, um, I, I believe she went further than any of the other uh, people that, that looked at it, people that were hired, for example, by, by the Ramses, because she had a chance to look at uh, some of their techniques and, and what they were doing during the course of that uh, civil case, the, uh, the Chris Wolf uh, libel case uh, versus the Ramses. So she, she had a pretty good idea of what and where, or what, uh, what techniques, uh, as I say, these people had and, and, uh, and the level to which they looked at it. And um, I mean, you know, th these people, again, don't get me wrong, they were professionals for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, from... My understanding of it, and I've talked to, to Sina just hours and hours, uh, I, I know that um, she went, it was, it was sleepless nights and just hours and hours and hours uh, of work. Uh, she, she poured her heart into, into that uh, analysis and uh, she did a fantastic job. And I think, uh, her, as I say, her work is, 
uh, is, is the best uh, analysis uh, in, in terms of handwriting on, on this particular case. And let's briefly explain about the Chris Wolf case. Chris Wolf was thrown under the bus by the Ramses in their book. He sued. He hired a lawyer named uh, Darnay Hoffman. And long, very long story short, Darnay did not show up for court the day of that the court was supposed to start. Now, it was Darnay and, and Chris Wolf that got Sina Wong to uh, do the handwriting. And there's a lot more that, that is um, that we haven't seen yet. But this is this is plenty. Believe me. And I'm going to show you some more here in a minute. But he didn't show up. So Judge Carnes, all she had was the Ramsey side. She had no other evidence because she just went ahead with the trial. And so she said it was obviously an intruder because all she did was look at that evidence. And of course, the Ramses will show that forever and ever. And you got to tell people, hold on. There was no other side presented. It was just their side presented. And Judge Carnes should have waited. Apparently, it was a legit medical condition that kept Darnay Hoffman from flying out that day. And um, she wouldn't. Now, Darnay Hoffman, unfortunately, committed suicide. Uh, he was married to the Mayflower Madam, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And he committed suicide in the most awful way. He stabbed himself. And, and I talked to Darnay several times, and it was just, it was heartbreaking. But um, anyway, so these examples are from that particular court case. So let's just go over this first page here, Okay. Now, keep in mind, it's not just one thing. It's over 200 examples, 240 examples, I believe. And no other person came close to that many matches on the ransom note than Patsy Ramsey. Okay, and we're just going to go over a handful of them tonight. Okay, here's the letter C. Okay. Here's, an, is this a C or an, is this a C? Another C. Look, you see, and, and, uh, I think Cena would point out, look at the little dot at the top of the C there, you know, look at the D, look at how the line comes out and it has a little tail. Look at the A, all right? It comes up, has a little curve there, a circle and a curve. And what is, the, is this another D? I'm not even sure what, or is this, a, what is this next one, Cynic? I guess it's a D. Um, yeah. Yep. I mean, that it's, you know, got a line through it. Another one got a line through it. Let's take a look at the E. Okay. Notice how the E has a little tip there at the top. Looks like a little tip and it comes out has a little tail. Now, th these E's are what are really amazing to me. Look at, oh, look at the whole thing. I mean, look at how the top of the E is made. It comes down and it's just a straight line out. And look at Patsy Ramsey's, you know, it's like a little triangle and then boom, straight wide out. I mean, she does all these different E's that match the ransom note. Again, look at this, you know, the E is filled in, the E is filled in. We'll keep going here. The O's, there are many O's here. And, um, you know, has a little tail. The second example has a little tail. First example, you can see how it's kind of thick and kind of jerky. I, and Cynic, stop me if I'm explaining something incorrectly or, or you want to add something, okay? No, you're doing well. <laughs> okay. Uh, same here, the shape of the O, little teeny thing on the top there. And then look at this one with the tail, with the tail. Those are things you can't hide when you're trying, when you're trying to hide, okay? Now, yeah, this P is not as big. Let's see, I want to make sure. Um, the ransom note is the one on, as I'm looking at it, the one on the left, and Patsy Ramsey is the one on the right. But look at this P. I mean, look at how the square, how the top is like a square. All right, let's continue. And here's my favorite. Do you even know what this letter is down here, right here? That's a Q. Ransom note Q on my left. I, I See, I'm not sure because of the camera. It might be totally opposite. And then Patsy's Q on the right. And I believe you said this, Cynic, that uh, 
she, uh, um, Sina had access to handwriting that wasn't asked for by the police, just handwriting found around the house where she wasn't trying to disguise anything, you know, handwriting from, you know, months ago, notes and things like that. She had access Correct. to that where other handwriting experts did not. But you guys, the cue, do you really think a an intruder would have the same cue as Patsy? I mean, I know you can't just lay it on that, but my God. Let's continue on. And she's made uh, notes here. She said, the base of the lower case S in respect is positioned up towards the intersecting point in the lower case P. So you see they're connected. And I think they showed this on the video. This type of habitual letter placement is not conscious conscious to the writer. So she's doing this and not even thinking about it. She's connecting the P and the S. Okay, now we're talking about an apostrophe here. And a, uh, let's see, earlier there was an example of a comma that deviated from the taught form. Here is an example of a reversed apostrophe. In other words, the apostrophe isn't going the direction that it normally would go. It's going the opposite direction. Now, what a shock. The uh, intruder has the exact same thing when it comes to apostrophes. They do it the opposite direction. And look at this again. The E-N connection is evident in this example of the words sense, but also look closer at the first angular upward stroke of the letter N again. And all of these are on websleuths.com and I will link to them so you can see them yourself, okay? And the double L's in the examples call show that the ending strokes in the letters LL have a small toe-like final. I mean, look, it's got a little toe, see it? Both of them, little toes. And again, these are things that you would not be conscious of when you are trying to, even trying to absolutely um, disguise your handwriting. You would have no way of even thinking about this. And again, these are from, uh, you know, examples of Patsy's just regular writing from a notepad that wasn't asked for by the police. And that's the difference in what Sina Wong had than any of the other experts. And I did find uh, it was 101 exemplars that she uh, was using during the course of her uh, investigation. Uh-huh. That's a lot. There's a lot. And uh, I, one of the, I'll just answer one of the criticisms levied against uh, Sina. Okay. Uh, by, you know, essentially haters. Um, they, they say, well, all she kind of focused on were similarities. Well... Cena was under uh, massive. This was this whole uh, this whole civil case was kind of thrust on her, and she was under a lot of time pressure. She felt that the most important thing to look at were, you know, are there you know were there similarities? Um, mm -hmm. But she did note um, after uh, after the case, uh, she you know she continued to to look at uh, uh, look and, and examine. Uh, you know, the handwriting that she had in her possession. And that uh, she also, as I say, because of uh, the discovery process, she um, also had a chance to look at uh, the, the Ramsey's experts. And what the Ramsey's uh, experts were claiming were dissimilarities were actually variations. Mm -hmm. And Patsy wrote with a tremendous range of variations. Some of us in, our, in the course of our writing are, are fairly, you know, rigid or, you know, if we write a, an A a particular way, and that's kind of the way, that's kind of the It'll way it is. It'll always be that way, right. It'll always be that way. Uh, Patsy loved to mix things up. I, I, you know, she was ambidextrous, uh, and she also just, uh, I don't know, maybe just for fun uh, in, in a lot of cases, I, I think she just liked to mix things up. She was artistic, um, you know, as I say, for whatever reason, but she did love to, to write with a wide range of variations. So some handwriting experts uh, now whether they're being genuine or they're just simply looking to muddy the waters uh we're essentially saying well you know we're essentially pointing to some of these variations and labeling them as dissimilar 
uh, and therefore uh, lessening um, in their reports the probability that that, uh, that Patsy was the writer of the note. But uh, right. that's all they were, is variations. And Cena would have been more than willing to uh, to go ahead and, and point that out in the court of law if need be, that's for sure. Uh, everybody, I'm putting the link up to WebSleuths where you can see all of these examples. And what you have to do is you have to download a PDF file. Okay, and let me put that in the notes here. So. There we go. Uh, inside for one, how about questions, my darling? Yes, I have a couple. Okay. <clears throat> I think it was Red Raven Spirit asked about, there was a photo of the Ramsey's bedroom taken on the morning of the crime and mm -hmm. one side was made and the other wasn't. So she was asking if they slept in separate rooms, the parents, or if not, that's me. Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, Patsy yeah. supposedly never went to bed that night, right, Cynic? Yes, that's, that's the most probable uh, explanation for that. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as I know, they did sleep in the same. They, they did sleep in the same bed. So um, the, the the likely explanation is, and and because of course uh, people will recall that uh, Patsy, who uh, was not known to to dress uh, the same way on uh, on two consecutive two never. consecutive she days, never wore the same yeah. clothes twice. Yeah, she uh, came downstairs and then greeted the uh, the police officers and others uh, wearing exactly the same outfit that she wore to the uh, to the White's uh, uh, Christmas party the day before. Okay. <laughs> oh, the frog. I love that frog. I love it when he makes that noise. It's like he's clearing his throat or something. <laughs> so, Mike Mig so, asks. Go ahead. No, it sounds almost tropical, but anyway, it go does. ahead. It does. It sounds like you're in the rainforest. Yeah, I live by the ocean. The pond is our rainforest. Close oh, enough. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um, Mike Mig asks, do you think evidence is buried with John Bonet, and that's why John does not want her exhumed? Good question. Um, I, I guess if I had to lean one way or the other, I would say no. Um, but I think the primary reason that they uh, resisted uh, John Bonet being exhumed was uh, it would put to rest once and for all the stun gun theory. There you go. That's it. Now, uh, to kind of uh, expound on that a little bit, uh, a lot of people thought that John Ramsey put something in John Bonet's coffin, and he may have. But the biggest reason, like Cynic said, is they want to use that stun gun theory, and it can be disproven if she is exhumed. Uh, and I'm totally paraphrasing an interview that they did with Barbara Walters. And Barbara Walters said, again, paraphrasing the late, great Miss Walters, said, uh, you know, why wouldn't you want to exhume your daughter if you would be able to find more evidence and things? And he said, no, 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 she's been through enough. Let her, let her rest. Let her rest. Again, we had Mark Class on here the other night. Can you imagine, can you imagine Mark Class if they needed evidence to catch the killer and saying, no, let her rest? That's bull. He right. knew those stun gun marks were not stun guns. And if you read James Kohler's book, there's a great logical, see the frog knows, there's a great logical <laughs> explanation for those marks. So uh, it has to do with laying on pieces of train track and the, me the measurements are perfect so yeah but again that is not a i wouldn't totally rule that out that there was something in there that he didn't want anyone to see and he put it in there with her would not rule it out 100 percent. that's for sure so it's a good question anything's possible absolutely yes i do have another question though that brings up something I'm i was ready. wondering if cynic has heard of he's a british expert named Stuart hamilton what he said about the stun gun marks no, I'm not aware of that. Okay, mm -hmm. what, I was just what, wondering what, if he was what did um, he say? Legitimate. What, yeah, what did he say? Do you know? Well, he showed photos. It was on an interview he did. He showed photos with the stun gun next to the marks and then a train track things. And he said the injuries are bigger Wait, from the train track would have been bigger if they were from a train track. And he said, it's like preposterous to think it was a train track. 
but I don't know how legit this guy is. That's why I was right. asking. And, and also let's remind everybody that the uh, company that made the stun gun said, if I'm not mistaken, that those weren't stun gun marks. So, and I would get, I would look at James Kohler's book. He's got it there. It's yeah. legit where he has it. I don't know this person. And again, you, I'm not trying to say he's, you know, a bad guy or anything, but uh, haven't heard of him. It obviously didn't pick up. The uh, media didn't pick up on it. The Ramseys aren't using it. So I think that says a lot right there. Yeah. In, in terms of, uh, well, the stun gun thing, it's, I've, that, that is one area that's uh, of the case that I've really actually taken a very extensive look at. Uh, and it actually bothers me now when I watch uh, certain things. As a matter of fact, I watched a movie just a couple of days ago uh, where a person was uh, stun gunned. Actually, there's a few people. I think there were two people that were stun gunned during the course of this uh, of this movie, uh, and it, it essentially it showed more or less the, the person, you know, being completely incapacitated or unconscious. It was kind of unclear the way it was portrayed in the movie, but Ridiculous. there are other instances where, uh, you know, I, I've seen things where a person gets made, uh, contact is made with a stun gun, and they fall down and they, they they appear to be unconscious and just like completely out of it. Um, and this is just simply not true. Uh, anyone. I, as a matter of fact, I would, if anyone doesn't believe this, I would strongly suggest other, and if you don't believe the other things that have been uh, written in a, a number of books, including uh, Thomas is certainly Kohler's, uh, and there's, there's actually a, a, another book called uh, Listen Carefully, Truth and Evidence. That, that book has a fairly extensive uh, section on, uh, on the stun gun uh, theory and why it's not true, but I would challenge anyone if they don't believe any of, you know, sort of the, the contrarian evidence that a stun gun uh, was used, that they would go to uh, some law enforcement agency. Uh, hopefully, uh, they live in a big enough city that uh, the whatever law enforcement uh, uses uh, stun guns, and and just have a chat with uh, anyone who has any expertise of any sort uh, with stun guns. And they will tell you that stun gun contact does not produce unconsciousness. It produces pain. It's noisy, it's painful, and it I will scream. be. And, as, and in, uh, say for example, if, it's, if you can sort of maintain that contact during the course of the contact, uh, that person will be incapacitated. That's true. They're not gonna be unconscious, but they will, their, their movements would be you know, essentially uh, null and void because of the electrical current uh, going through, uh, through their body. And of course, that's, that's uh, much more the case when a taser is utilized and you get the two barbs that come out from the stun gun and they make contact uh, and embed themselves in a person. Uh, and then uh, all the officer has to do is uh, pull the trigger then on the taser and that will send the current uh, through and that person, as long as the officer is holding uh, that trigger, uh, that person will be incapacitated. Again, not unconscious, incapacitated. But uh, if you're just using a stun gun, not a taser in terms of firing the barbs, but you're just trying to make contact and keep contact with those prongs, uh, as, as soon as contact is broken, that person is then able to, to, to move, to scream, to talk, to do their normal, yeah, the, the normal things that a person can do. So to suggest that a stun gun uh, can, as I say, render a person unconscious, that's just absolutely 100% untrue. Unless there's, you know, I, I'm not saying, and, and people that's, uh, that are in the business of uh, producing stun guns, I mean, there have been people that have even been killed uh, with stun gun, but they must have, but they would uh, have some sort of physiological uh, issue that would cause that. So right. it's not to say that uh, if you stun gunned uh, 10 million people, that none of them would go unconscious or that uh, none of them would, you know, potentially die. That's not true. But the stun gun was never designed to uh, produce unconsciousness. That was not the design element of a stun gun. It right, was, it was it's, made to stun them. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and 
not make them knock out. Yeah, and, and if you just, you know, even if you uh, just Google uh, stun guns and people just goofing around, you know, stunning each other, um, yeah. you know, you it see is. guys, yeah, you see, yeah, you see kids, uh, you know, whatever in uh, at uh, university or college goofing around, say, you grab a stun gun and just, you know, <laughs> stun gun somebody in the back or what have you. But, you know, again, so they're, they're going to scream and they're going to move away from that stun gun. And that's all that happens. They're not going to like go unconscious and uh, you could do with them whatever you wish. That just, right. that's, that's pure fantasy. And for some reason, uh, it, it's something that Lou Smith seemed to just grab onto and, yes. and suggest that, uh, like, you know, during interviews, he said that, you know, it was used to incapacitate uh, John Bonet. That's just not true. And then he had that other crazy, uh, that extra crazy thing where he said that he thought he saw a little blue line between uh, the two marks that he thought were stun gun marks. And he said that that's because when you uh, pull, pull the trigger on a stun gun, you see that little arc across and that's blue. Well, then there you go. It's a blue, <laughs> it's a blue line on John Bonet's back. Meanwhile, this is just like an art, you know, a visual artifact. And it, there's no way that uh, that arc would produce a blue line on a person. Again, that's just pure loose mid fantasy. It, right. Fantasy is the right word. And just remember this: if John Bonet was stun gun, she would have screamed. Yes. And she wouldn't have stopped screaming. Okay. So, and supposedly, if he was to, he wasn't gonna, he wasn't going to incapacitate her when he got her down in the room where nobody could hear her. This would have to be while he was lifting her up out of bed. So, again, there are so many things that are so ridiculous, and I really hope tonight, and, and Cynic, you did the heavy lifting so far, so far, far more than I did. I cannot thank you enough, because we do this once a year, and even if we change one mind once a year, to me, it's worth it. And remember, everybody, when John Ramsey is out there saying, oh, these were just traffic cops, and they didn't ask for help completely false, completely false. When he says uh, that they were exonerated by Mary Lacey, oh, yeah, but why she did it was for completely false reasons known only to her. I believe in my uh, opinion, she's mentally ill or had some sort of organic brain issue. Really, I'm not being facetious because nobody else that looks at that letter goes, oh yeah, this is legit. That letter is not legit, and, the, and there has not been one other DA that has upheld it. That was so wrong, and it was so full of misinformation and flat-out lies. Remember, in the letter of exoneration, uh, she says, Mary Lacey says, that the DNA is the killers. She knew there was more than there were at least three different mixed samples. There was not just one male DNA there. Three or more mixed minute samples that could be easily explained by simply walking through a room and every like they said in the the piece that we showed you everybody has foreign dna all over them and she knew this and she lied okay and so then let's get to the dna dna is a red herring we don't even know if there is enough left to test it is a mixture it is not one person henry lee has said from the beginning he thought it was a sneeze in the manufacturing and if they do more DNA testing, they may use it all up. They don't want to just, you know, do that just because John Ramsey wants to. John Ramsey, in my opinion, really doesn't want those test results to come back because they will come back. No, this isn't the, this isn't the killer. And then what will he do? You know, I think they know the police are not going to uh, turn over that DNA. That's just my, my opinion. But uh, yeah, they... And they'll never mention the ransom note. Or if they do, it's very brief. Very, very brief. And again, if they bring up the uh, court case where they were sued and the judge found for them 100%, it was because the plaintiff's lawyer did not show up for medical reasons. And rather than wait and reschedule, the judge just went ahead. And they do that sometimes in criminal cases, too. If they can't find the, uh, the defendant, they'll just go ahead and try him. You know, uh, so it does happen, but it's very uncommon. And I don't know why that judge did that. And they don't have their big pit bull anymore, uh, Lynn Wood, because he's lost his mind. And I hope now that more people will come forward 
because anytime anybody mentioned anything, he would sue. And remember this one final thought. They did sue a lot of people and insurance companies settled with Linwood and the Ramseys. We don't know how much they settled for, but the people that they sued did not have to admit they said anything wrong, did not have to stop selling their books. And I believe without question that they settled for a small amount. The insurance companies went, yeah, we don't want to fight this. You know, hell yeah, we'll settle it. You can say you, you that we settled. And that way, they, you know, they want to save the money. But they didn't make them do any retractions to anybody they sued. Not one person. And remember this, there was one time that uh, the company did not back down. And that was Fox News when Carol McKinley did a report and she mentioned something about Burke. She didn't say Burke did it, but it was just something about Burke. Well, boom, Lynn, Lynn Wood sues. Guess what? Fox didn't back down. They went, screw you. We'll take it to court. You know what happened? They dropped the case. The <laughs> Ramses. So remember that people, please. I'm begging you. I am begging you look at the evidence and let's get somebody that knows the truth to interview John Ramsey. I'm so disgusted with Megan Kelly and Angie, uh, Ashley Banfield for just letting him ramble on like that. That's so wrong. And uh, I, I don't understand it, but those are the only two places he'll probably go on or somebody else really, really friendly to him. He'll never come on here. And I think you know me well enough to know I would be extremely polite. I would not get angry. <clears throat> I would not insult. I would be extremely polite. I would have John Andrew on, but you know, he's a big little snotty baby who won't answer any questions. So always remember those things, my friends. Okay. Uh, Cynic, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, a few. Like I don't, I don't know how you were doing for, for time here. Uh, oh, we got, wanna... it's, it's up to me. We can keep going as long as we want. <laughs> I won't be much longer. As I said, I, I reread uh, Steve Steve Thomas's uh, book uh, a few days ago, and uh, one of the things that uh, sometimes, you know, it, it's amazing. You know, obviously, what you you know, forget little little details, uh, you know, here and there. Uh, the cell phone records that the uh, Boulder police tried to get during the course right. of their investigation. Um, it is amazing just on its own. Uh, in Steve Thomas's book, he says that the uh, Ramsey's, this one blank. Uh, Ramsey started the service in January, 1994 uh, with a company called AirTouch. They said that uh, 91 minutes of use were logged during the August, September billing period of 1996 and 108 minutes were used in September to October. October into November was just as busy. December, however, the only period we were allowed to see was empty. No calls at all. I asked if someone could have removed billing records from the computer. No way, the AirTouch source told me. That's so, so weird. Think, yeah. That's so, again, another bizarre thing. They're only allowed to see these records, and there's nothing there. Nothing there. Yeah. That's so it's, crazy. It, you know, if you sort of want to go down some some more conspiratorial um, sidelines. Uh, it is interesting that um, when I spoke to uh, Fleet White, uh, he indicated that uh, I think it was about four months down the road uh, from, so it would have been, I guess, April-ish of 1997, uh, lawyers from Lockheed Martin came by and told them to kind of cool it with regard to his activities. What? I don't remember that. Maybe I knew that, but it flew out of my mind. That's kind of not in the. That's kind of not in the public uh, domain. Oh my yeah. god! Why would they do that? Yeah. Uh, and what, what do you think? <laughs> well, it's like Lockheed Martin would be the type of uh, organization that would have the ability to, for example, blank cell phone records. Well, boy, they would, wouldn't they? There's a very good point. So that's, that's exactly just a thought, everybody. Just yeah, just a thought. It's, yeah. I'm not saying anything that wow. way, one way or the other, but it's it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting. They would have the power. Yeah. Um, 
we mentioned it last time around as well, but uh, there's the linguistics aspect that, uh, that fits nicely with uh, handwriting. And again, you could have, um, you know, um, dueling experts, but um, one, one person who is arguably perhaps the, the, the premier um, linguistic expert uh, said that, in his, and certainly in his mind, he had no question uh, that Patsy was, uh, was the writer of the notes based on linguistic analysis. So not only did you have uh, Sina Wong's analysis with the 243 similarities he found, and, and he also had access to a lot of exemplars. I don't have an actual number in his case, mm -hmm. uh, but he was provided with uh, as many uh, exemplars as the police were able to, to uh, come up with. Uh, for his examination and uh, from from her use of uh, acronyms to exclamation marks to the language that she used, uh, general writing style, everything uh, in, in his eyes uh, pointed to Patsy Ramsey as the writer of the note as well. It, it is. There's so, so many things. And uh, Teresa Gosnell, thank you so much. Uh, so Trish is the only person that really tells the truth about this. This has been so educational. Thanks for keeping the truth out there. Thank you. And again, could not do it without Cynic, our main man. So continue on, Cynic. You've got keep those thoughts coming. I love them. <laughs> uh, just a couple of sort of random points. Um, this one also from Steve Thomas's book. Uh, questions were raised when detectives described the dispute about <laughs> whether the spider web at the basement window was elastic enough to have been stretched. No photographs have been taken, and there were contrary opinions on whether the metal grate was moved. Uh, Mike Kane, uh, one of the prosecutors involved in the grand jury, simply asked if a police officer could testify to seeing the web intact on the morning of December 26. Ever Everett said several could, and Kane nodded in approval. So uh, in order to get into that window well and break the window and reach in and get in, you would first have to lift off a grate that covered that window well area. And there were several officers that said they saw a web intact between the grate and the, the surrounding area. So right. again, people could say, sure, well, maybe, you know, the spiders redid a web or, you know, it was done, you know, during that period of time or, or what have you, but it's just a, another little interesting aside. Uh, and of course, the 911 call enhancement, which, some, which oh, sometimes uh, gets lost in the shuffle. But, yes, it does. Uh, there were uh, there were voices heard uh, after uh, Patsy supposedly uh, hung up the line, but she didn't hang up correctly. And uh, voices were heard, and one of the voices was Burke. Uh, showed he was uh, that showed he was awake. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they still say that uh, even though they acknowledge that Burke was awake. Uh, they refused to acknowledge that he was anywhere in the area during that 911 call, despite here, what the comics. Here they have hardcore evidence, and they're just, yeah. again, lying. And journalists let them get away with it. Makes me yeah. crazy. Oh, keep going. I, let's do this all night, please. You don't have anything to do tomorrow, <laughs> right? <laughs> Come on now. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Covering the broken windows, the police. Do we have any more questions, uh, insightful one? Um, I haven't seen any other questions. Okay. I have a comment if you want to hear it. Sure. Okay. So it was, nowadays, there are no other suspects, correct? No. no. One. There's no never one. been any other suspects, right? Right. So I was re-watching interviews today. And Alex Hunter said something that I find very prophetic now. Mm -hmm. He said, the list of suspects narrows. Soon there will be no one on the list but you. Oh, I remember that well. And yep, who's on the well. list. And the, who's <laughs> on the list now. Yeah. It's prophetic. Who, it, that is very prophetic. And uh, yep. that's it. They likened that speech to the uh, World Wrestling Foundation speech. Because, like, Alex Hunter was just such this, you know, wussy little guy who was like the Pillsbury Doughboy when it came to strength and um he comes out there we will find you and they're like what yep. the hell what do you mean <laughs> yeah there'll be nobody left but you well there's nobody left but <laughs> no intruder again we don't know 
and we can we haven't even talked about the pineapple and the fingerprints and the flashlight. Yep. There are so many things uh, we could do this literally for days. And uh, you know and what? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say there'll still be people that won't believe it when it's right oh, sure. in front of them. But uh, please, Senate, go ahead. Uh, it, just in terms of uh, the, uh, as we've noted, the uh, the Carnes uh, decision on the uh, on the civil case involving Chris Wolf. Uh, what what people need to remember, uh, certainly at least when considering that particular uh, decision, is that um, th there was, of course, uh, another judicial uh, inquiry into all this, and that was the grand jury. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we noted in the last show, it was a bit unusual in a grand jury format to have sort of the defense side presented. It's typically, this is the prosecution's uh, case as much as they wish to reveal in front mm -hmm. of uh, a panel of uh, grand jurors. And um, you know, they're, they're looking to, to present evidence to see whether um, these people think that there's enough to, to proceed with a, with a formal criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. But in this particular grand jury, uh, given that everything seems to be unusual in the John Bonet case, uh, there was a very, very significant uh, presentation by various people of so-called Team Ramsey. Mm -hmm. So you had Lou Smith presented his case, uh, presented yes. his evidence. You had right. John Douglas presented uh, his side of things as well, which, uh, Again, he seemed to be sort of taken under the spell of the of the uh, of the Ramses, mm -hmm. uh, which is very unfortunate. It's, it's yes. too bad as somebody with his reputation. But uh, anyway, so he presented uh, his information to the grand jury, um, and also as that one grand juror noted in the uh, video, that uh, they also received uh, handwriting uh, handwriting presentation as well mm -hmm. uh, from the other side. I I'm not sure. I don't know if there was any sort of pro-prosecution uh, handwriting expert, and possibly it would have been maybe Chet Yubowski from uh, CBI. Oh, right, right. Um, but anyway, so they, they looked at the handwriting evidence, and also they were extremely aware that there was um, unaccounted for uh, DNA uh, that belonged to someone other than the Ramses, potentially. Yes, exactly. So, all of that was taken into consideration and mm -hmm. they did vote to indict. They still voted to indict. I want to read, uh, connect the dots. Uh, that's an all out lie that it was Burke. That's fake information. Uh, connect the dots. Okay. Let's just say you're right. Even though I, I disagree. Doesn't change anything. Doesn't change anything. Everything we've shown you tonight. Let's just remove Burke being on the 911 call. Let's remove that. Does that change anything? Insightful one, does that change anything, do you think? That's... There's so much. That is fake. There's so much. Does she mean that it was Burke? No, that it, no. What Connect the Dots is saying is that it wasn't Burke, that that's fake information. Um, uh, Cynic, what do you think, uh, if we take that away? Well, the, pe the people who who heard it are, are pretty adamant. Um, even, well, I, be, I believe Kohler heard the, uh, the enhanced mm -hmm. call. And that's the thing, you, you, can't, you can't listen to what's just out there in the, in the public domain because it just, you know, you're not gonna hear it. Right. Uh, but there was an enhanced version uh, that Steve Thomas heard, uh, Jim Kohler heard, uh, and, and these people say that, as far as they're concerned, um, they feel that um, that it was Burke, or it was certainly uh, an unaccounted for male voice that sure sounded like Burke. Let's put yeah. it that way. So, but but you know, it, it's it's really not terribly relevant because the, the bottom line here is that uh, where is the evidence for an intruder? Like even if uh, there is legitimately some sort of unaccounted for um, male DNA uh, that isn't some sort of a composite uh, or that's, um, uh, you know, let, let's just kind of give them that, that, that there is a, a, an actual 
a legitimate profile that isn't some sort of a cobbled together or composite profile. Mm-hmm. That, that still does not exclude the possibilities of, con- of contamination, just as, as an example, exactly. or, some sort of, or some sort of innocent transfer that's, that ended up um, there. Um, it, it's entirely possible, and there's, you know, again, all it would take is just some uh, reading a few. There's there's some great books out there in terms of uh, sort of DNA um, problematic cases, shall we say, where uh, DNA seemed to sort of point in one direction, but it ended up being that it was uh, transferred there, um, mm-hmm. you know, in, innocently right. uh, by contamination, what have you. Uh, so. And it goes to the heart of what Lacey said. She said that there's no innocent explanation. Well, that's that's that shows a depth of uh, ignorance with respect to DNA that is mm-hmm. is right up there, because yeah. there anyone who is familiar with uh, DNA uh, would never say a, a statement like that, because there's always uh, so-called innocent uh, avenues of uh, of DNA ending up somewhere. Absolutely because, right. The, the question is. Oh, yeah. go ahead. No, no, I'm, I was just babbling. You go. Yeah, no, the, the, the question is, like, you know, have, and, and you have to keep in mind, too, it, it, and this goes back to uh, did, the, did the police and other agencies properly investigate the case? Well, they've, uh, they've looked at, I think there was like 200 different um, people that they, that they took DNA samples from, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, uh, the, the so-called profile such as it is, whether it's a sort of a real profile or kind of a ghost profile that's been uploaded to CODIS. Mm-hmm. Regardless, that continues to go through the CODIS cycle. Yes, the people that are into investigative uh, uh, genetic genealogy will say, well, sure, but that's, you know, pretty, pretty back in the day, we should, uh, you know, go with what's out there. Mm-hmm. You could go with the, what's out there, uh, but that doesn't mean that still doesn't mean anything if it's some sort of uh, you know transfer from you know who knows where uh, of, of someone just so unrelated that may not be I, I really actually do wish that you know whether um, a law enforcement agency or whether someone like Othram does get if there is something to be uh, to be looked at like in mm-hmm. terms of a usable sample I really wish that they would, because it would, it, it, it's almost like exhuming John Bonet. It would right. put to rest one of these things that just continues to be out there and continues to be something that the Ramses uh, go to time and time again to sort mm-hmm. of justify perpetuating that, hey, we're not the ones, uh, Lacey exonerated us, there's this mystery DNA, it's not us. And just completely ignoring all the other evidence that points to someone within the house, whether it's mm-hmm. Burke or whoever, uh, being responsible or some sort of a collaborative effort there. Maybe Burke right. struck her struck her accidentally, and then other people did other things to uh, to John Bonet. Um, whatever the case may be, but uh, there is a ton of evidence that points to, to the problem being within that house and nowhere else. Exactly. And it, it's, you, it's, it, it's the old law enforcement thing, the totality of the evidence. Yeah. The, 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 exactly. the DNA, yes, is always important in any case, but it's not all of the case. It's not the if end it, all in this case. No. If it, it's, it is still only one piece of the puzzle. How large of a piece you want to make that in your mind is up to you. But mm-hmm. it is one piece of a puzzle where there's a lot of pieces that point to someone within the house being responsible. Absolutely right. And I want to read one last thing. First of all, Glam uh, Dolly said earlier that Cynic is great and we agree. Uh, Glam Dolly 30 says about the pineapple, and this is the truth, uh, the pineapple in John Bonet's stomach is significant only because it contradicts the Ramsey's claim that they put John Bonet to bed as soon as they got home and she never came downstairs. And in the next show we'll do probably in a year, unless something happens, uh, we'll, we'll get into the pineapple and the fingerprints and all of that. Cynic, I can't thank you enough. You are a brilliant man. You've done so much to help get the truth out there. Uh, People have no idea how hard you've worked on this. And I, for one, just want to thank you for everything. And if there's anything I can do for you, you just give me a call, okay? It's my pleasure to come on. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, Cynic. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Good night.
Oh wow, that was a long show for me. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna need to eat my own weight in nachos and go to bed here soon. That's all there is to it. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, happy new year. Um, and thank you all for coming to our special John Benny Ramsey show. I was so excited. When Steve Thomas said he would come on, he could only come on for a little bit because he did have other obligations. And I was so grateful. And, um, you know, he he is, as he said in uh, when you're we talking to him, he's very grateful to everybody for keeping the truth out there. And that's what uh, that's what we're going to do. Hey, real quick. And we'll talk more about this tomorrow. But uh, there is more information out about the uh, arrest in the case of the Idaho Moscow murders. Now, apparently the suspect's father drove across country with him. I don't know how they found that out. Uh, they've uh, interviewed uh, the owner of one of the bars, I think in Pennsylvania. And we find out now some of the very uncomfortable things that uh, Brian was saying to women, like they come to the bar and he'd say, well, where do you live? Are you alone? You know, things like that that just creep them out. In fact, at this particular bar, and I'll get the article out tomorrow and read it, but at this particular bar, the uh, the employees complained. And so the owner said, hey, you know, you're welcome back there anytime, man, but you got to stop with the creepy comments. And he was shocked. Brian was shocked. He had no idea what he was talking about. And they never saw him again after that. And that wasn't that long ago. So I don't know. Have you seen any of that uh, info, Insightful One? Yes, I have. Yeah, it's it's crazy. So I'm sure we'll have more tomorrow. Uh, and again, he oh, and he's waived his extradition. So he could be back in Idaho as early as Tuesday. Once that happens, that arrest affidavit should be released, should be, because that's, I understand that's the law in Idaho, but we'll wait and see if they try and close. I can't imagine why they try and shut it down. But anyway, very, it is interesting though, that he did ask supposedly, was anyone else arrested? Did he have help? Did he just let that slip? Or was he just seeing if they only had him? I don't know. We'll wait and see, but we'll get all of that out there tomorrow. We'll be back at regular time tomorrow, which is 1030 Eastern. Thanks to Allison in Facebook land for sticking with us. And thank you all for the super chats. Um, and uh, insightful one, if you could just read a few more comments, I just want to make sure I haven't missed anybody. And then we will head out for the night. <clears throat> Lisa Ryan says, Happy New Year. Wait, it disappeared. Uh -oh. Happy New Year, Trish and fellow sleuths. I'm arriving late, going to watch the replay. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate everybody being here. It's been it's been a lot of fun tonight and interesting. And again, I can't say enough about Cynic. I mean, what a truly amazing human being. Honest to God, he is just something else. He, he sounds like me with the Peterson case. He's went and researched every possible thing ever. Right, right. Yeah. And you and you can remember it. And you when you see misinformation out there, you're like, no way, that's not yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And I will be putting up the links to the videos that we showed and all of that. Um, uh, but uh, I, uh, I need to make something to eat first. I really do. I really, no, that's not what I wanted. Uh <laughs> Hold on. Now, why can't I find, see, this is what I hate. They update Venmo and I have a donation here and I can't find the name of the person. Transactions, that's what I want. There we go. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> Ruth A, thank you so much, my darling. And Terry Lynn G, what a doll. Thank you both very, very much. And to everybody in chat who, uh, who, donated and just coming here and hitting the thumbs up means a lot. Doesn't cost a thing and it really helps this channel. Thanks everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night, 1030 Eastern. Oh, I want to say thank you to Ping the Router and to Moonlight View and Love and Coco. And of course to you, Insightful One. Thank you for everything. And we'll see you all tomorrow night on Web Sleuths YouTube Live at 1030 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Bye-bye.